Welcome back to Dion Talk. Another Tuesday. This will be a nice short live stream that lasts as long as the questions do. I'm going to talk for a few minutes on a on the subject of debt, all things debt. That should give people a chance to see the notification, log in, get your questions ready. Um, about 10 years ago, maybe a little more now, 11 years, I decided to take control of my personal finances. I had made it to the age of 40 without ever having $1,000 in the bank. Um, I think most of us have this day where we wake up and we realize that you have more control over your finances than you think you do. And for me, it was 40. I hated debt. At that point in time, I was a single parent with three kids. I had been laid off from a police department and had started working at a truck driving school, teaching people how to drive trucks, making about 17 bucks an hour. During my divorce, just before getting laid off from the police department, I found out about a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt in my name that I didn't know existed until the divorce. And I live in Washington state, which is a community property state. So um, the debt was our debt. Um, doesn't matter if you know about it or not. It's not fraud if you're married. And after the divorce, she filed for bankruptcy. So our debt became my debt. Wasn't making a lot of money. Had custody of three kids. Um, and all of a sudden found out a bunch about, about a bunch of bad debt. Not a good position to start from. And so that anybody doesn't get depressed, it took about 10 years to not only reach financial freedom, but reach a positive net worth of over a couple million and get rid of all the bad debt. And ironically, what helped me get rid of the debt was more debt. And if you find that you're in a lot of debt, here's something that I did that actually helped. I found out about a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt, mostly credit cards, a couple personal loans, a, an apartment complex where we had rented an apartment that I didn't know about for over a year. That's fun. And a dentist bill and a couple of other things. And I was on the phone with one of the collectors who had, you know, I found out my ex had filed bankruptcy and he asked me if my plan was to file bankruptcy too, because if I had intended to file for bankruptcy, that they would take about 20 to 25% of what was owed and forgive the rest, as long as I didn't include the amount in a bankruptcy, which I didn't know was a thing. And at the time I was working in law enforcement and bankruptcy is not really an option because it's kind of a career killer. If you have financial problems, you're more likely to take a bribe. So I wasn't even thinking bankruptcy wasn't an option, but I contacted every single of the, the debtors, the people who I now magically found out I owed money to, and almost all of them reduced the amount that they would take as long as I didn't name them in a bankruptcy. Um, the dentist, the apartment complex, and the discovery card wouldn't budge. Their, their amount stayed the same. Pretty much everybody else lowered their amount from a couple of hundred thousand dollars in debt to about 89000 That's what I ended up having to take care of. So, Single parent with three kids making $17 an hour, $89,000 in bad debt it is a lot of bad debt. Even though it's a reduced amount, it still sucked. So at that point in time, I hated debt. My brother had reached financial freedom by buying rental properties. He had a paid off home and he took out a home equity line of credit, used that money to buy a rental property, usually a falling down mobile home in the middle of nowhere on acreage that he would then you know, he has craftsman skills. He would turn it into a really good rental. He would focus on all, all of his income until he paid off the home equity line of credit because he didn't like debt either. He was using the debt from the house to acquire the assets, but then he would focus all the cash flow to get rid of the debt. He's never carried a mortgage. He's always paid cash or used his home equity line of credit to buy his rentals. The first time that I had a conversation with him and I said, hey, I'm thinking about buying rentals and I'm going to be using mortgages. He actually called me stupid. Um, which is normal in our family. So it's a term of endearment to call me lazy or stupid. I was stupid for joining the military. I was stupid for becoming a cop. I was stupid for getting married. So, well, they're batting a thousand actually. So I didn't have a paid off house. I couldn't take out a home equity line of credit. I wasn't making enough money to save up money and buy something in all cash. So before we get into debt, I want to talk about um, Dave Ramsey who talks about his seven steps and how much he hates debt. So the first step is, is great. 
you know, save a thousand dollars. Pretty much everybody would benefit from having a thousand dollars saved in the bank because the, the statistic from a study was 40% of people in the United States can't handle a $400 expense without going into debt using a credit card or having to borrow money. Um, so <laughs> I agree with that. The, the, the rest of the steps kind of lose it for me as an investor. And I, I get if you're a Dave Ramsey follower, a lot of people have benefited from him. And, and if you don't have an investing strategy that is going to use debt, most of his steps work for everybody. But if I had used his strategy, I would still have to work for probably another 20 years instead of being debt bad debt free now. And work has been completely optional since 2018. So it took me about eight years to make work because I was using debt. And if we went back to when I first found out about the bad debt, the last thing I would have ever said in my life was, <clears throat> I wish I had more debt, but I do. Right now, I wish I had more debt. I just wish I had the right kind. In Dave Ramsey's teachings, he talks about the debt snowball. And it's actually the method that I used before I knew that it had a name or it was a thing. And this is where you pick your smallest debt and I used a version of this. You pick your smallest debt and focus on it to pay it off quickly. So you get the dopamine hit of taking care of a debt. You take the payment that that debt had and any extra money that you had and you put it on your next smallest debt. So I used a version of that. The debt avalanche is when you pick your highest interest rate and you focus to pay that off first because mathematically that makes the most sense. So for me, what I was focusing on in the beginning was a bit of both. I looked at interest on debt, if I had bad debts, so the credit cards, the personal loans, the things that were in my name that I didn't know about, and I looked at the highest interest rates, anything that was at 6% or higher, I focused on to pay off. So it's kind of using the debt avalanche method because I was going for the highest interest rates first, but I used both because I took all of the debts that were above 6% and I looked at the smallest valued debt above 6% interest and focus to pay that off first. My, my mentality was if I have a debt that has more than 6% interest on it and I pay that down, that is like getting a 6% return on my money because I'm not going to be paying that amount of interest. When I look at investing, the path that I saw for investing and I, I used buy and hold small multifamily and house hacking, I've house hacked twice and I'll cover what that is if it's your first time to my channel. I used house hacking to reduce or eliminate my housing expense so that I can speed up the ability to pay off the debt and the ability to save for the next investment. When I invest in a rental property, my return first year is 10% or better. So if I can take my money and invest in a rental property and get a return, that return can be used to pay off debts. And in my mind, if it was 6% or lower, it made more sense to acquire an asset that paid me more than the debt costs on the asset so that I can use that cash flow to pay off the bad debt. Understanding that there is good debt and bad debt is the, is the mental shift that most of us take when we read the book, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. He's got probably 18 books now, two that I recommend to everybody, the rest if it fits your, your strategy or not, you can go for it. But the first one is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that's where we realize the difference between assets and liabilities. And it, it kind of covers good debt versus bad debt. And then, and then after I cover good debt and bad debt, I also want to cover weird debt. And so once I cover that, let me know if you've heard about weird debt before too. Because there's debt that's not really good or bad. It's just weird. If you buy a car or you have consumer debt, credit cards, personal loans, payday loans, things where <clears throat> you are borrowing money to buy things that aren't going to make you money. The house that you live in, if you buy a primary house that is, you're, you know, you're not going to rent out the rooms, you, you, you might have an asset when you sell it and you might profit from it, but while you're living in it, it costs you money. To me, these are all forms of bad debt. There is a benefit to owning a house. So even if you're not an investor, I would still recommend being a homeowner over being a renter in most cases. But if you buy a rental property or if you borrow money to start a business and that business generates more money than the debt causes, or if you use margin when you're investing in stocks, it is possible to generate money 
from debt. So there's bad debt, which is the consumer debt. And then good debt is debt that makes you more money than the debt costs. And in my case, bad debt or good debt is when somebody else pays off the balance on a rental property, a part of the, the mortgage payment that you make every month from the that you make with the rent money pays down the principal. So understanding good debt and bad debt is one of the first steps and then figuring out how to get good debt. I had a bad debt to income ratio. I had a lot of debt. I wasn't making a lot of money. So I couldn't just go out and buy a rental property. In order to do that, to get around that hurdle, I moved from my house into an apartment and rented out the house for two years to get rental income on my tax returns. After two years, lenders were able to look at the rental income of the duplex I was looking at in my debt to income ratio so that I could buy a property, even though I still wasn't making a lot of money and still had a bad debt to income ratio. When I moved into the duplex, that created almost $300,000 more debt than I had. Remember, I had $89,000 in bad debt, and I paid off some over those two years. I was saving at the same time. About half of what, of my, what you would call extra money that wasn't being spent on living expenses went to pay off everything that was over 6% interest, and half went into a savings account so that I can get into a house hack because I wanted to reduce, reduce or eliminate my housing costs, which is, our, for most of us, our biggest expense. So that was my focus. While I still had bad debt, I was saving for that first investment. I moved into the duplex. It was um, about $300,000. There's closing costs and, and some very small immediate repairs. I buy places that are either rent ready or already occupied. So I'm not doing rehabs. I'm not doing the burn method. I'm not doing a lot of work. I move into the duplex and I go from the debt on the house and the $89,000 in bad debt. I add almost $300,000 in debt because I use a 5% down owner occupied loan. So I had saved up about $20,000, which meant that I needed $15,000 for the down because it was 5% of $300,000 would be $15,000. And then there was closing costs, uh, you know, the appraisal, the inspection, those kind of things. Um, and some of that was covered by the seller. This was before it became a seller's market and sellers were covering some of the closing costs. You have to have reserves too. So that's an amount of money that you'll need to save if you go to buy an investment property or a house hack or even a home that you live in. And at the time, what I did is I had some money in a retirement account, which I have since emptied because I have a list of reasons why I don't want any money in a retirement account. But at the time, lenders would use 50% of the money in a retirement account and you don't have to take it out or tap it or anything, but they'll take 50% of that and count it as a reserve. So that's how I got the duplex. I created $300,000 in debt, about basically it's $285,000 so, or so, in order to reduce what I was paying for housing. In the apartment, my, my housing cost was $1,500 a month. When I moved into the duplex and the other side was rented out, I was paying about $300 a month. So that meant I was able to save to invest or to pay down the bad debt an extra $1,200 a month because I created. $285,000 in debt, which is good debt because the other side was rented out. And now I'm house hacking another place. So that first duplex, <clears throat> both sides are rented out. It's profiting over $1,000 a month now. And each month, the tenants that pay me the rent, I take the $1,000 that's profit. I set aside money for repairs and vacancy and maintenance. And a portion of that covers principal pay down. So every month, every month, that place is appreciating in value, being worth more. The tenants are paying down the mortgage so that gap between what I owe and what it's worth keeps growing. That's kind of like a savings account that keeps growing every month without me having to actively put money into it. Because I created debt, I have more money. It's about it was 14000 a little more than $14,000 a year added to my ability to save because I took on extra debt. I repeated this. The next one took about two years to save for. The next one took a little less than two years because this thing called the income snowball starts to kick in. When you have cash flowing assets that are producing more cash than the debt expense that you have on them, that all starts to add together. And you start making money fast enough to where the time between purchases gets a lot shorter. <clears throat> Michael Zuber from One Rental at a Time and Matt the Lumberjack Landlord often talk about recycling capital. So they get that gap really big and then they do a cash out refinance or take out a home equity line of credit or they've sold properties to reinvest in something else and do a 1031 exchange. I have not done that. The way that I recycle capital is I did not let my life creep increase. I didn't get a nicer car in the first few years. I didn't start taking vacations. I didn't do all the 
things that now I could now afford to do, I didn't just start doing. I recycled the cash flow. Every penny that came in from my rental profit in the beginning went into a savings account. And then there became this inflection point where the rental profit became more than my living expenses. So at that point in time, I took the rental money to pay for my life. So 100% of my W-2 income became a savings amount. And now it's about 65% of rental income and 100% of... So every penny that I've made from work goes into my saving for the next investment category. And about 65% of rental profit goes into that account too. That income snowball starts to kick in and you save quicker and faster to do what I'm hoping to. I'm hoping that this year I can create at least an, another million dollars in debt on purpose. Because as I invest, the more debt that I have, the more cash flow I generate. My net worth is increasing with each per property that I purchase. So there's a, there's a couple of fundamentals that I want to do too. Um, figuring out if you want to invest or pay off debt. To me, it's the interest rate. If you have a low interest rate debt, like most of our mortgages now, if people have either purchased in the last two or three years or refinanced because rates drop so low, it doesn't make sense to pay off a low interest debt. So one of Dave Ramsey's steps, and, and I forget his order of, of, of his steps. Um, so first it's save a thousand dollars and then it's pay off all debt except for your house, which I guess if, if the debt was considered a high interest rate, I'm, I'm all on board with that. Then you want to save three to six months of, of emergency funds, which I agree with. So two of the first three steps, I agree with 100%. Then he says to <laughs> invest 15% of household income to a retirement account. So I've, I've got a, a list of reasons why I don't want any money in a retirement account. Um, if you don't have any form of investing that generates cash flow and a retirement account might be a good idea. But in my case, since my goal is to generate cash flow, uh, there's no there's no reason for me to have money in a retirement account other than investing for the match from an employer in a 401k or a simple plan. But even that, that's money that's trapped away that's not paying me now. It's not giving me cash flow to save or invest. It's not gaining me four times the amount that I've invested in appreciation because I've used leveraged on a, on a rental property. It's not getting me principal pay down. And the tax benefits of a retirement account are terrible when you compare them to the tax benefits of real estate. Um, so after saving the 15%, Dave Ramsey says to save for kids college and for me, if if you want your kids to go to college, there are a couple of paths to take. Uh, first, saving for college or a trade school kind of goes into the same bucket. There are some accounts that you can save for that. I really like what Brandon Turner from Bigger Pockets did. And to save for his kids' college or vocational school or investing, when the kid was born, when his daughter Rose was born, he purchased a fourplex in Aberdeen, Washington. The place cash flows about $1,000 a month. So he buys an asset that he cash flows from, but he buys it on a 15-year note. So when that kid turns 15, that property is paid off. Before the kid turns 18, he will do a cash out refinance, take out the value because the property is paid off and it will have appreciated over that time. That cash out refinance to 75 or 80%, it's a loan to value, will be the amount of money that his daughter either gets to take for college, a trade school, or to invest in real estate or whatever the goal for that person would be. Even after he does the cash out refinance, he is still going to own an asset that cash flows. So if you have young kids right now, um, Jeremy Kirkwood, who's been on my channel, actually names each one of his properties af after one of his eight kids. So that at some point, those, those kids will either inherit, I don't know if he's going to inherit the property or the cash out refinance money or whatever his strategy is, but there are, is a way to save for your kids' future by using debt to invest in real estate. And then the last thing in the Dave Ramsey steps is to Build wealth so you can help other people, which I agree with. So what is that? Three out of seven rules I'm 100% on board with. My only problem with Dave Ramsey, and if you support Dave Ramsey, I, I totally get it. Feel free to attack me in the comments, is he never points out that he went bankrupt and lost everything because he was using 90-day debt. He swears debt is terrible and you should buy houses in cash and you should pay off your mortgage. And if you're making $10 million a year because you have a 
radio show that's syndicated, sure, that makes sense. But for the average mortal, um, that's not the best option sometimes. Um, let me see where we're at here. I have a couple notes on debt I want to make sure I don't miss. So how much debt would be too much debt? Most of us are old enough to remember 2008, there was a housing crash and debt was a major issue. The, so in my opinion, the amount of debt is not the problem. It's the percentage, the ratio of debt. If you have assets worth a certain amount of money and they are leveraged 100% or more, you are set up for failure. In 2008, not only did people have ninja loans, no income, no job, no assets, they could just go into a bank and, and say, I make $400,000 a year and the bank would lend them money. People had adjustable rate mortgages. We don't have those now. But even worse, people were borrowing 105% of the loan of the bank. I did this. My house that I purchased before 2008, it, we, it was like $98,000 and we borrowed $104,000 because that $4,000 or that $6,000 above the purchase price covered the closing costs. So we had negative equity day one owning that house. And as long as prices went up, great. Um, because then if the interest rates went up, you could refinance and prices don't always go up. In 2008, people lost appreciation, lost the principal pay down. Those two things can disappear when prices go down. And if that happens when your interest rate goes up and you're underwater on your house, so you can't refinance, you can't sell, and people weren't doing 105 LTV loans anymore, they started doing 75 and 80 because that's where they should be. So over leveraged is what happens when you have too much debt. It's not that the amount is too much. It's that the amount compared to your the value of your assets. So in my case, I like my goal is to maintain about a 70% loan to value. If I had assets that were that were worth $100,000 total, I would want a $70,000 mortgage so that I have some equity. I can handle a dip in the prices. I can handle problems if I had to sell and get out without creating more debt for myself. But I have enough leverage on an asset to where I didn't have to put $100,000 down to control a $100,000 asset. I have $30,000 in equity to control a $100,000 asset. So if I have $30,000 invested into a property, it's worth $100,000, and it goes up 10%. I don't gain 10% on my 30,000. I gain 10% on the 100,000. So that's why with my portfolio across the board, I want to maintain at least 70% loan to value. I'm around 55% right now. So on my next purchase, I might do, I might, I've never used my VA loan. I was in the Marine Corps. I have access to a VA loan. I've never used it because I want since I've become an investor, I want to maintain an equity position. So when I buy a property, I want to put down a down payment. I did the 5% down on the duplex, but since then all of my down payments have been 20 or 25%. So I have a better equity position to start. But right now with the appreciation of the properties and the principal pay down across the, my mortgages, I have such a high equity position that if I purchase my next property with zero down on a VA loan, I would still be over 70% loan to value on the whole portfolio. So I don't look at each asset by itself. I would look at the whole, the, um, the whole picture. Um, so that's what I consider too much debt is over leveraged. And that's the percentage that I keep. Um, one of the problems that people can run into if you pay off your mortgages, if you focus and pay them off, which I did one time and I can explain why if anybody's curious, but my plan going forward is not to pay any off until I get at least 10 mortgages in my name. Right now I have six, I own seven properties, six mortgages, six of them have mortgages on them. If you pay off the mortgage, at some point you, you will not have enough depreciation or write-offs to where you might have a tax obligation on your rental profit, which is not technically a bad thing. Never pay interest to avoid taxes. Like don't create debt so that you don't pay taxes because the cost of the debt would be more than the tax benefit. When you buy something, 
take advantage of the tax benefits. So I think people say, don't let the tax tail wag the dog. If you have the opportunity to take advantage of write-offs and depreciation and things like interest on a loan, you take advantage of it. So I'm not going to create debt on my properties just so I can have tax benefits. I might do a cash out refinance or take out a home equity line of credit to buy another asset, but it's not for the tax benefits. It's just tax benefits are something that I would take advantage of. So in, in this instance, understanding yourself is the first step. Do you have the discipline to not create bad debt? You know, not get a high interest car loan or buy more car than you should or buy more primary residence than you need until you have the cash flow from assets to pay for it. Can you use a credit card? And I buy absolutely everything I can on that credit card because it has cash back. I want that cash back reward. I've never carried a balance on the credit card though. If you, if you, there was a myth from the eighties or nineties, I mean, the credit, the FICO score was um, proposed like in the sixties and in the 1989, it finally became the credit score system came out. So there's a myth from the eighties or nineties where people said, if you, if you carry a small balance from one month to the next, it helps your credit score, which is not true. Making sure you use less than 10% of your available credit has a positive impact to your score, but carrying a balance does not. So I pay my credit card off every day to make sure that I never have that negative impact. And my credit score is not great. It's about 800. So there are people with higher credit scores. So if you have another channel that you watch where they teach you how to do credit scores, great. My goal is to keep it at 740 or higher because when you're getting mortgages on rental properties, there is no difference to the lender between a 750 and an 850. Anything above 740 gets you the best rates. So my goal is to keep it and it fluctuates every time I can buy a mortgage or something or buy a mortgage, get a mortgage. It drops my score down to 780. And then two or three months later, it's back up to around 800. Um, so if you don't have the discipline to use a credit card and pay it off to where you never carry a balance, then maybe a credit card is not the best option for you. Um, so that first part of this video at some point will probably be pulled out and put into a separate video on its own. Those are my opinions on all things debt. There's good debt, there's bad debt, and like you saw in the thumbnail, there's a time to pay off debt, and there's a time to create more debt. So let me get to the, the howdies. Um, and I see that Michael Smith, hopefully you're here, this was put up, this was a comment a couple hours before we went live today. Um, question, so howdy Michael. Dion, will rent prices fall if houses prices fall? My fear is buying market buying market fall and being stuck upside down on price that has happened to me i was upside down on my house prices dipped down i owed more than it was worth then if rent prices fall being underwater every month they're on the way up they're kind of related as prices go up rents follow there's a couple factors pushing prices up right now but more people buying means that prices of houses are going to increase. And at some point it will become so high that they're coming out with first time home buyer programs where lower down payment, down payment assistance, jumbo loans went higher. And the most scary thing I've heard in the last couple of months, lenders are pushing for adjustable rate mortgages so that home buyers can get in on a lower payment. And three years from now, we'll have another housing crash. So be ready for that. But on the way down, rents and prices don't track. In 2008, when there were all of those foreclosures and a lot of people lost their houses or had purchased houses they, that were more expensive than they can afford, and foreclosures happened, that created more renters. In 2009, there was a short dip in rents when everybody was afraid and hearing there's a housing crash going on and the stock market had the problems going on. But at the end of 2009, 2010, 2011, Rents went up. Buy and hold investors who weren't looking to flip or wholesale made out. They 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 did really well. So in in if pr housing prices go down, to me with my portfolio that would be a good thing. I'm not flipping. I'm not recycling capital. I don't need to take out a home equity line of credit or do a cash out refinance. I'm not worried about the equity in the houses. I maintain at least 30% equity and so I could handle if I ever had to sell, right? I'm not going to take pocket, take money out of my pockets to sell an asset. But even if rents plateaued, 
if prices go down, I get to go to my county tax assessor and show this is what the new comps are. Prices have come down. So my tax obligation would go down, increasing my operating uh, profit because my expenses would go down. The rents would stay the same. If something happens that causes housing prices to go down, there are specific markets where it can, the rents can drop. If you live in an area where, let's say, hypothetically, they make a bunch of cars and all of a sudden all the car manufacturers move to other countries, that place might still not recover, right? So there are pockets of markets that don't that do not do well and can lose rent. So one of my strategies to avoid that, and there are many ways to invest in real estate. There's no one right way, right? There's no right way to do it. There is a right way for you. And the right way for me is small multifamily. I, do, I want four units or less because one of the things I really like about debt, since that's the theme for today, is getting 30-year fixed rate debt. Five units or more, you usually get commercial loans that have a loan reevaluation period or have an adjustable rate mortgage. So I don't want those. I want 30-year fixed rate debt. So when housing prices go down and we get more demand on rentals, like I said, rents can go up even if housing prices do end up going down. So that's not a concern I would have, but I don't want all of my small multifamilies in a tight area. Another reason why I prefer you know, four units or less is if I were to buy a 12 unit complex and it was in one spot, my tenants are pulled from one source. So if it's in an area where a bunch of companies shut down or a port closes or a base moves away, I might lose all of my tenants. But if I buy duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes that are all at least 10 miles apart, they're drawing from here in Washington. Some are Boeing, Amazon, Microsoft, Joint Base Lewis McCord, the state capital. So my tenants come from different sources to where there would have to be a catastrophic event where multiple types of um, economic drivers would go away. So that's how I avoid being in one pocket market that could be negatively impacted by something changing like manufacturers leaving. Don, howdy. Wolfmaster82, howdy. I appreciate everybody coming in today. Um, I don't have a meetup this week like I did last week. So tonight the questions last, uh, the live stream lasts as long as the questions do. John W, howdy. Hey Dion, thank you again for your help. Happy to help. That's so, all. Howdy. Sean can shine. Howdy, Dion. Howdy. Daniel Cheryl <laughs> retracted his message. Howdy. Now I'm going to spend the whole night wondering what that message was, like I do every time. Cody. Howdy. Uh, North Colorado Dawn. Howdy. And everyone else. Pallavi Patel. Howdy. John, howdy, Larry, howdy, Phil Neeland, howdy, Daniel, howdy, I'm a, I'm a truck driver and have about 100000 in cash to work with. My goal is to leave the trucking industry in one to two years. Should I use part of my cash to buy a tractor and almost double your income in the meantime or focus solely on real estate? Are you sure you could double your income? The, the, the mat the, depends on how many trucks you have now. If you're going to go owner operator, you're not going to make any money. Your first year as an owner operator, if you own the solo truck, you'll, you'll probably make less as a wage than you would as a company driver. Two trucks, you're probably going to lose a little bit of money. Um, three trucks, you, that's where the metric starts to change and you can actually start to make money. So if you're buying a tractor and it's your first one, you're going to make less than a company driver. They'll say, oh, you're going to make about $150,000. But you're going to have 130,000 in expenses. Um, that second truck, when you when you don't really have enough to move employees around and cover shifts, uh, you you tend to lose money. It's the third truck worth people. So if you have to, and you're going to add a tractor, and you know, and you have the routes selected, and you're using things like Trucker Path or the apps, so you can get rid of the dispatch fees instead of paying 30%, you're paying like eight for the apps. Uh, you might make more money with a third truck. I personally, if I was a truck driver, which I have been. I would stay in that long enough to uh, get three or four rentals so that I can get that rental income on my tax returns and have the consistency to get lending on the rentals after you stop driving a truck. Uh, that would be my concern. Most people who think I want to quit my job to get into real estate, mess that up. 
the, the, the stability, the consistent income is what lenders are looking for. You can make $100,000 in profit on a rental or $50,000 at a W-2 income that is then taxed and isn't all profit. And you're more likely to get a mortgage because that 100,000 you made in rental income isn't a history. It has to be consecutively on a couple of years, rental profit, you know, um, your tax returns. So you need that history. So I don't know that I would quit the driving thing until I could generate rental income from several properties. You do have options like non-QM loans and asset-based lending, your interest rates are higher. So if you're in a market where it's really easy to find 15% or 17% cash on cash return deals where you use a bit worse lending and now your, your return drops to maybe 10%, sure. But if you're in my market where it's kind of actually hard to find that 10%, you know, I look at hundreds of deals to find the few that actually meet my 10% goal, uh, non-QM or asset-based lending would even make that harder. So John W. Question about rent amount. After mortgage insurance property taxes are paid, how much would you like in your pocket? So it's not really a cash amount per door. A lot of times in like in the bigger pockets forums, I'll see people saying, oh, I want to make $100 a door, or $200 a door. I want to make a minimum usually of $100 a door because I want to make sure that it's justifying the time it takes to manage property or a tenant. But what I want is the yield. So the, the accounting term is yield. In real estate, it's cash on cash return on investment. If I invest $100,000 to buy a property, and so I put in my $100,000, it's worth 400, whatever the, the numbers are. I want to get at least a 10% return in my market. This might be different in yours. Average in mine is five to seven, so I look for tens. If average in yours is one to three, you want to look for five or six. So you want to be looking for the deals that are better than the average in your area. And it does take two to three months to learn the average usually. So I want a 10% return, which means if I invest $100,000 that first year, I want to profit ten thousand dollars so if if i buy a duplex and i invest a hundred thousand dollars i want to i want the duplex itself not each unit to make ten thousand dollars which divided by 12 is what eight or nine hundred dollars in profit a month you need yeah nine nine hundred dollars a month would be ten thousand eight hundred in profit so i'm looking for that return i want to make at least a ten percent return on my money um, and that's in your profit pocket because you have principal interest taxes and insurance. Most people think that's your expense. And then the gap between that and rent is your profit. And that's not true. You're going to have future expenses. So I set aside money for vacancy. I do 5%. And then I set aside money for CapEx and maintenance, which for me, I've done 10%. So I'm setting aside 15%. If you're going to use a property manager, you want to set aside whatever that expense is going to be too. I self-manage. Blew my mind the other day. I did the math. Um, and I just transparently share numbers, so please don't sue me, bro. But last year, $128,000 in profit. Um, I self-managed my 16 units. takes me about two hours a month. So if I did the math on the actual amount of work that it went into manage the properties, to run the properties, I was making $5,333 an hour to do that last year. That's not how it actually works because it was an investment to get that going. And if I self-managed, if I hired a property manager, they wouldn't take all of the money. But just the math kind of blew me away when I realized the actual number of hours it took me to manage my side hustle, that was the hourly amount of income after taxes. Um, I should buy some real estate. That sounds really good. Um, Justin, howdy. Nick Post, howdy. Adion, can't stick around, but looking forward to the replay. Awesome, because then you can set it at 1.5 and get through it a little bit quicker. <laughs> Thank you. Tom, howdy. Thanks for introducing Todd Baldwin on your channel. I've been binging his uh, room rental bits. Yeah, Todd's, I, I watch his content. He is super articulate and intelligent in his videos. He does the research. Um, has some strong political views, so... Uh, I, I, I watch his channel and I love his channel, but it's really easy to lose subscribers if you show which side of the fence you're on, on, on almost all political subjects. Um, so I'm a fan of his and uh, I just would never want to say if I agree or disagree with his political views, whether, whether I did or didn't, uh, that's something I want to avoid because I just want help. I want to help people make work optional. 
and to me, that doesn't matter which side of any political decision you're on. Uh, Jones, howdy. Passed air brakes combination today and tried to do triples and doubles, but he said I need to actually have a Class A license first. What? That's not true. Maybe you're in a, are you in Washington State? Because that is not true. You need to have a Class A license to take that test to actually drive, which is something that we just found out recently. So our, yeah, weird. Um, here's something I did find though, that CDL examiners that work in the offices at the Department of Licensing in each state deal with CDL stuff about 2% of the time. Most of their time is dealing with regular car licenses. So sometimes they don't know the rules. Here in Washington, our students take the doubles and triples test way before they have their CDL. So good job on the test though. Um, I lost where we go. Okay. Tom, glad to have made it to your life. Thank you. Glad you're here too. Jones, oh, long story short, I passed now to go to school and get road ready. Exactly. Krista, howdy. Hey, so happy to catch you live. It's a first. Nice. This, this is how I look live. Um, Tom, you're also a truck driver. Nice. Cool. It's a seriously in demand industry right now. We had a driver shortage before the pandemic and then the pandemic amplified demand. So we've got local companies doing 10 or $15,000 sign-on bonuses from companies that have never had sign-on bonuses before. It's weird. Jones, uh, I'm coming to Washington for you to teach me how to drive. P.S. Thoughts on Ben Mala. His real estate content is okay. I'm going to have to check him out. Um, I should have a, a notepad here. I'll come back to this later. Tom. Hey, Jones. Oh, it may be state dependent, but in Maryland, we could test out everything I'm beginning until driving. Yep. Jones, are you in MD? Tom, okay. Tom, well, currently parked in PA. Okay. John W., what are some of the main things you look for when driving by a potential property purchase? Neighbors with junk cars in the driveway, upkeep properties, junk, garbage, and yard. Yes, I look for all of that. Um, I make the offers before driving by the properties. The closest I come is I do a Google Earth search and go down to Street View and look around at the properties, which could be a five-year-old picture, so it doesn't really tell you much, but it gives me the layout of the buildings. When I'm under contract, so I've got an offer accepted, I have my inspection period. I will order the inspection, I will order the appraisal, and, and depending on your, you know, the current market, it, it depends on which one happens first. There's no set chronology to that. I would prefer to do the inspection first so I could pull out before paying for an appraisal. But right now, appraisers are also booked up. It's weeks to get to one. So I order them both. But before they come, I'll go drive by the property. Because if I see something, like it's a war zone, and there's mattresses laying in the road, and you can't safely walk there, then I call and cancel and pull and would pull out. I haven't had that happen yet because I learned my market. So I know the areas not to make offers in. I would look for noisy streets, which to me, this would mean a noisy street would mean I would increase my vacancy rate. You're more likely to have turnover. doesn't, and it might make it a little harder to rent. But if there's a loud club or train tracks or something where I know it's going to be really hard to rent, then I might pull out. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I look for. That's, that's pretty much it. Cause I know the areas, um, a lot of cars would be, uh, has been an issue at a, at a couple of my rentals. Um, it's not been a deal breaker. I, again, the, the, the less attractive it looks due to anything in the neighborhood, the more I would increase the vacancy rate, at least in my math, to think if I had a 10% vacancy instead of a five, but I still hit my return. And then I would pursue and, and it ended up being great because I've had no turnover at the place. The one place where I've had, I literally went there and you have to kind of drive through because it, it's it's a circular area and there's it just seems like everybody there has about six cars per, per person um, so I've, I have thought of that too Janet howdy how are you I am almost marvelous then we will ignore the porn link um, my serenity howdy Jay Markey howdy what type of checking and savings account do you use for rental properties personal or business um, here is how my business looks. 
So the CDL school run very differently. I, um, there, I, I'm a 10% owner. I have 90% owner. So it's run, it's an LLC. It's like everything's done through business. Rental properties. One checking account, personal. One savings account, personal. One credit card, one that uh, I pay off daily and I just use it for cash back. Uh, Excel spreadsheet with a tab for income and a tab for expenses that I send to the CPA. Uh, that's it. Check your area. You might have the requirement to keep deposits in an interest bearing account um, that are that are separate. I just have to show proof that mine are in an interest bearing account. They don't care that it's separate because I'm not in an LC. Everything's in my own name. But know your local rules on that. Um, there are some financial institutions that require rental income to go into a business account. So you go out the door and you find a different financial institution that doesn't do that. Um, yeah, there's no real benefit to doing it in a business. There's no tax benefits or anything like that. So rental rental income for me, kiss principal. Keep it simple. And Subi, howdy. 800 is not that great. Well, there are some people who teach. This is how you get your credit score up, right? So if I was on a channel where I was teaching, this is how you fix your credit score, and I didn't have like an 830, I'd be a hypocrite. So at, at an 800, I can give you some advice on how to get your credit score up, but I wouldn't call this a channel to teach credit scores. That's why I would say not great. Angel R, howdy. Do you think rents will keep increasing this year? I do, but I'm not investing like I count on it. Um, rent is like appreciation. When there are increases, that is a great year. But never, and I hate to say never, but don't invest counting on appreciation and don't invest counting on rental increases. Um, I've looked into some syndications as as the deposit for or the, the down payment for the next property grows, I'm thinking, oh, I could put this money to work somewhere in a syndication. Most of the ones I look at are projecting 5 to 10% rent increases every year consistently for the next three to five years. That's dangerous because if that doesn't happen, the return those syndications are expecting is not going to be there. I expect rents to go up because we're still seeing wage inflation. We're still seeing high demand. Um, yeah, so I see several reasons why rents can go up, but I wouldn't buy a property thinking... If I can project a rent increase over the next six months and my property is here and those rent increase happens, then I get my yield. That's, that is a recipe for mistakes and disaster. Uh, area average rents, learn them as they go because they're, they're going up so fast right now, it's actually kind of hard to track. And wages set rents. If you, if you look at most of the Facebook groups, anytime the rent increase question comes up, people will say, well, have your expenses increased? Or how much of an increase is that for the tenant? And those two factors don't come into play when it comes to rents. What a person paid for rent last year doesn't determine what their rent is this year. Your expenses don't matter. The, the tenants don't care. If it mattered, rents on a property that was paid off would be a fraction of what the rents would be on a property that had a mortgage, right? Because the expenses are more. So then the rents must be higher. That's not how it works. What is the area average rent? To rent a, a unit similar to the one that you have available, what would somebody pay? That sets your rent. So the higher the demand, the more wage inflation there is because that means more applicants for rentals, which sometimes people get into bidding wars or they think, I, I put my rental up a week and a half ago for a friend and you get 15 applicants and you think, ah, our rent is too low. So rents go up because of demand. Wages sets demand. So I still see wage inflation happening. And uh, so I, rents are going to go up. Don't invest counting on it. Tom, market dependent. Yes. Andrew, howdy. Congratulations on getting under contract on the house you're selling. Glorious day to you too. Glenn, howdy. Tom, if prices fall and rates are refinanced down the road. If prices fall and rates are refinanced down the road. If rates go down, yes. Yep. Isaac, howdy. <laughs> Tom, your howdy didn't post. Howdy. I'll give you two. Martin, howdy. Howdy. Great to be here. 
Andrew. Update on the short term we are buying next. We are going to pick it up subject to with closing costs down only. Nice. Awesome. And you are under contract for a sale. Is there going to be gains from that uh, that you're going to then have to figure out a place to put it to work? Uh, it's Jax. Howdy. You mentioned you preferred area to buy is class C. Could you tell me what is obvious sign of class C area? Uh, I wish I had a link to it. I, I just need to save it somewhere. Brandon Turner from Bigger Pockets has a write up on class A, B, and C neighborhoods. So if you just Google Brandon Turner Bigger Pockets class of neighborhood, it'll pop up and it, it breaks down what is a class A. So you figure it's a spectrum. A is the the more expensive areas, and D is the the war zones. So class C is you would generally feel safe to go there. Things aren't fancy. They're usually not gated communities. Uh, you, you'll have, it's not next to a 7-Eleven. Maybe it's next to a Panera Bread or, you know, like a, a, the people who live there are your, your regular working people, cops, nurse, teacher, that kind of stuff. Your class B is almost your McMansions, your bigger houses, your, your 3,000 plus square foot houses, not a lot of small multifamily, normally normally gated communities. And Class A is your, your Scottsdale, Arizona area, so your, your fancier side of town. Each town usually has each type of property in it. But I like Class C because people will move from Class A or B down to a Class C in, in, in a bad economic time to save money. So there's more demand in bad times. And not too many people move to Class D because you don't feel safe to go there. Um, so it's 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 kind of to me the safest bet. And I'm a lot more comfortable when I rent out a three bedroom for two thousand dollars a month. I feel like if that person moves out, it's going to be fairly easy to find somebody else willing to pay two thousand dollars for a three bedroom in this area. If I have a three bedroom house and it's rented for six thousand a month because it's a Class A neighborhood and the mortgage was it was. $1.5 million to buy it, finding a $6,000 tenant in a class A neighborhood, I would not sleep at night thinking if my tenant moves out, I'm going to be covering a huge mortgage while I find another tenant. But in my class C areas, I, I put a posting up and my last one that I did for my personal self, I had 12 applicants within four hours and it almost became a bidding war for rent. Uh, but the right applicant applied and was qualified. And I just said, yep, take it. And you're in there, which reminds me that that one's coming up. No, I got like three or four months for that one. And I get to go tell that tenant, hey, we are not doing a rent increase because I don't usually do it the first year that they're in the, the place. I usually do 5% every other year, except for 2021 when rents skyrocketed because remember area average rents, set your rents, not what the person paid last year. In 2021, I did the binder strategy with almost all my tenants. I still have three to go, uh, which I'll be doing in the next month. And I will update how those binder strategies went. So... And Adam, howdy. I'm soon receiving a settlement for around 80K. I have about 15 in bad debt and love with my and live with my family. Use it to pay off bad debt and invest in real estate or invest and then pay off the bad debt. I would go back to, if you get a chance, if you weren't here at the very beginning of this video, there, I also have one video on my channel on choosing whether to invest or pay off bad debt. If you have bad debt that is at 6% or higher interest, I would focus and pay that off first. That's a good enough return to justify not investing in a real estate and getting that guaranteed return. If the debts are 6% or lower, I would invest to get a return on that money and use that money to pay off the debt. So that would be my choice on there. Um, I'm a fid. Howdy. Yeah. The TDS is strong and taut. <laughs> Building a bag. Howdy. I'm going to have to ask what your name is about. I'm a bag guy. I should show you my bag. Um, hi, I'm a bit of a, in, I'm in a bit of a tax problem. My lender says I have to have two years of taxes. Thing is I sent in 2019, but they haven't put it in the system. Do you have to have transcripts to close on a unit depends on the lender usually they're going to want to see tax returns but you can do what's called an loe letter of explanation 
showing the tax documents that you used. These, these are my W-2s. This is the, the signed form that I submitted, but it's not in the system yet. Um, you might find a lender that then goes, oh, let's, let's look at 2018. Lenders are not all made the same. So that's what I would do. Letter of explanation and use the documents that you have to show what your income was. Um, and you might have to lend a shop to find one that's okay with that. I'm a fan. I discovered Ben Mala before one run all the time gang. He's hilarious and genuine. He's not a douche like Cardone. <laughs> well, uh, I do watch Cardone. I like I like the energy sometimes. I um, and I think it's a little bit childish for me of me, but I think that somebody with that bad a grammar who could be that successful gives me hope. Um, so I'll I will have to check out Ben Mala. Uh, Jay Mark, howdy. Yeah. If I self-manage, am I technically a property management company and should I keep track of all expenses to file a Schedule C? I don't file. I keep track of all expenses, but I'm not a company. I self-manage my properties. If I self-manage somebody else's, yes. And know your area. I know that if you are in Idaho and you have a certain number of units that you manage, you're supposed to have a real estate license or some ridiculous weird law that somebody tried to explain to me that I don't understand yet. Um, but I don't have those units there, so I haven't taking the time to learn that law, but learn your local state laws on what you need to do. Um, hurry. Knock it on. Andrew Wilkins, sweet deal, congrats. Million Dilibo, howdy. Jay Mackey, also a truck driver. Guess we all hang out here, right? <laughs> exactly. Martin, besides the binder strategy, do you use other techniques to reduce tenant turnover? Yes. the ten, Reducing tenant turnover starts before you buy a property. So earlier I said, I, I don't want to buy next to a busy street. That's going to create tenant turnover. I wouldn't want to buy next to a noisy club or train track or airport landing strip. I don't want to buy, although I have made offers on when the deal looked good enough, small multifamily that are over under units. If a unit is above another, you might get more noise complaints or one plumbing issue can affect two tenants instead of just one. So I buy side by side and I prefer to have the garage in the middle. So they're actually, their living walls are separated by more space. Um, I want units that have at least two bedrooms and a garage because more space equals more stuff. More stuff means less likely to move. I allow pets because people don't like to relocate pets. And even if you move the pet with their human, that is still a relocation for the pet. I want washer dryer hookups inside each unit because tenants that are using a laundromat or shared laundry are just waiting for some place to open that has it inside the unit. People don't like going out and doing laundry. Uh, so there's several strategies that I do that help me limit tenant turnover. Um, since I buy rent ready or already occupied properties and I don't have to do a rehab, usually my expenses are very low. So I keep my rents a little below the area average. I'm not at or above the area average. Being a little bit below it also helps not have tenant turnover as much. I've had two in 10 years, so it's not zero. It's about as close as I can get. I had one tenant who went to the hospital and passed away. And then his spouse went to assisted living. And then I had another tenant. who So that's, that's one turnover. And then the other tenant inherited a house. So I totally get why she moved. So I've had two. Uh, so it's not a what we call flawless victory. But uh, there's one other thing that I just thought of. When I have a tenant move in, a lot of people collect security deposit, first months, and last months. I do not collect last month. It gives the tenant the perception that their last month is paid for as long as they move. Every time they renew a lease, it pushes off that paid month that they've already paid for to the end of the lease again. I don't want to do that. So I collect first month, and deposit. That way, at the end of their lease, if they end up wanting to move, they don't have a free month to save up money and go move somewhere else. So I've, I, it helps limit tenant turnover to not, and also when a tenant moves in, first month's and deposit is four to $5,000. If you add last month on there, it's six to $7,000 for some places. That's a lot of money to expect somebody to come up with, in my opinion, for class C. Uh, so that's some of the strategies that I use for limiting tenant turnover. I have a video on my channel called How to Keep Your Tenants, and it goes over how to limit tenant turnover. Uh, <laughs> Tom, smash the like. Thank you. I would appreciate that. If The way I like to think of it is 
if my information earns it, hit the like button. And if you don't like it and you just hate me, hit the dislike it twice. Show me how much you hate me and hit it twice. Um, Tom, Dion, does your nonprofit find driving jobs in other states? We find driving jobs anywhere. The nonprofit actually focuses on non-driving jobs. So the CDL school, contact us. We'll help you find a driving job. Don't even care. Get your CDL from a different school. We'll help you. Um, but the nonprofit is for like HR, IT, operations, logistics, forklift, mechanic, all those non-driving positions. So if you have a friend looking for work, they can reach out. We'll help with that too. But it's all over. There are companies like Semex that are in multiple countries. So we have military spouses we help in other countries to find jobs. doesn't have to be here in Washington where we are. Um, and, and I'm not saying the, con the companies are like Swift or CR England because they're everywhere. Companies like Oak Harbor Freight Lines and Redaway and YRC and, and the local LTL companies are located in every state. So, yes, I think I answered that too long. Um, and then I lost, let me see. Knock it on. One of my tenants works for Kroger. He is getting a $5 an hour raise. So wages are going up. His lease is coming due in July. Break out the binder again. Exactly. What is going on in that market? That will determine where the rents go. Andrew, no gains. We live in the house. We're selling for four of the five years, 240 gain. Right. So, and I, don't, I forget, Andrew, if you're married, but um, you had up to 500,000 in gains for no taxes, but you have to, you got the 240 in gains to put to work. That was what I was looking for. So if you lived in it, yeah, you definitely, yeah, it, it is the IRS 121 exclusion, where if you live in a property for at least two out of the last five years, you don't have to pay taxes on capital gains for up to $250,000 per person if you're married. So yep, two would be 500. Say, so, uh, it is almost like there is a place called Congress that is full of a bunch of people who own a bunch of real estate and keep making rules and laws that help people who have real estate. It's, it's, it's really odd. Um, million. Dion, did you say 15% for expenses, maintenance, and CapEx? So 5% for vacancy and 10% total for CapEx and maintenance and repairs. And even in years where I've replaced a roof, I haven't come close to, to spending that. Um, if you're buying older properties that haven't been updated, you can, uh, you can adjust those rates higher. If you use a property manager, you can adjust that rate higher. I've never had a vacancy. My two tenant turnovers, the, the one I had four days to get the house ready and the other one, it was like tenants are out, tenants are in. So I've never had an actual extended vacancy. I still set aside 5% because I could have a vacancy. If your vacancy rate is higher, maybe set aside more for that. So the total that I would set aside is 15%. And really when I buy a property, I run the math to make sure I'm getting my yield as if I set aside 15%. But I have a video on my channel called How Much in Reserves. So when I had less than, I had seven or less units, I, I kept $10,000 in a reserve account. So that $10,000 was to replace a roof, a water heater, or do whatever, or pay for a month's rent if the tenants weren't there. If that 10,000 ever dipped below 10,000, 15% of gross rents would go into that to fill it up to 10,000. Once I got more than seven units, so I'm at 16 now, I keep $30,000 in that account. So anytime it's below 30, 15% of gross rents go back in there to fill it back up. When it's at capacity, when it was at 10,000 or now that it's at 30,000, I don't keep setting aside 15% of gross rents because somebody did the math for me last time, uh, $23,000 in gross rents, which has gone up now because of the binder strategy a couple of times, I'm getting like a $1,200 a month personal raise starting in February. Um, it's like you should buy some real estate. It's good stuff. 15%, instead of going into that $30,000 account because it's full, goes to the investing account. So investing, the, the timeline to buy that next uh, cash flowing asset gets faster because the extra money goes to the investing account. One thing I make sure is that that 15% is never in my lifestyle column because that would be money that I need and if that account ever went below 30, I don't want to need the money that I'm going to refill it with. If it drops down, I'm just taking money that would be going to the investing account back into there until it's full. Hopefully that made sense. Um, Dion, did you say 15%? Okay. 
Jmark, Dion, just curious, why not increase rents by a fixed amount at each lease renewal, something small like 2%? Because when I first purchased the property, I usually did the binder method and the tenants in the beginning, because they, they're usually so far below area average and they've been neglected. And then I, I wait two months to kind of screen them because I didn't get to, to do a background check. And I do the binder method. A lot of times those tenants almost every time have requested that two-year lease because they asked for a $300 or a $450 rent increase. That's a big increase, which is, and it brought me to my return. So I don't need each deal to make me a millions of dollars. I want them all to be good deals over time to buy financial freedom. So generally it's a two-year time between when I did the binder and when they're going to do it. So that one year there isn't going to be an increase. So when I talk to them, I've either set the pattern where every two years we're going to sit down and do this binder method or in, in from, you know, 2015, 16, 17, 18, when rents weren't going up very fast, 5% every two years. To me, the tenants were really happy because they had a year with no rent increase. And sometimes they would have a one year lease and they would renew with no rent increase and, and the tenants were happy. And they had a whole two years of me saying, in two years, you have this 5% increase coming. Um, but again, in 2021, I did the binder strategy with existing tenants who had maybe been with me long enough to have that two-year period and a 5% increase, who then had this, and, and I don't know what the math is, but going from 1,600 to 2,000, it, uh, what is that, 25, 20-something percent increase? So that's not the 5% that they would expect, but here's the binder, and it was their choice. They requested it. Um, so that's that's kind of why I would do two years at 5% instead of 2% each year. Uh, yeah. Michael Smith, hit the like button. Thank you. Appreciate it. Tom, new topic to explore. Hate your job, buy a house, get a part-time job in new industry for two years. Be renting also. Have a real estate empire while working the 7-Eleven. There you go. New topic to explore. Hate, I like that. Hate your job, buy a house. Okay, part-time job. I'm always surprised by how many people are in jobs they hate. If it pays more than $100,000, I can kind of see it. But I know a lot of people who are making forty dollars to $50,000 and they hate their job. An entry-level truck driving job starts off over $70,000 a year. A local job. So you, you work eight to 10 hours driving a truck around your local town and you park it and you're by yourself and you're in the truck. There are so many jobs where you can make that 40 to 50,000 that people stay in jobs they hate for that amount. I, I, I always been confused by that. Um, Michael Smith, dangerous question. Awesome. In the current culture environment of the military, would you recommend young people to join for college money, career or job training? Um, I have a jaded opinion because I almost think everyone should do some time in the military in some capacity. It, it, it doesn't make you better, but it amplifies you. So if you go in a pretty decent person, you come out amazing. Uh, I think a lot of people can benefit from being in the military. I, I did not use my GI bill, so I wouldn't say go in there for college benefits. Uh, right now, I don't think unless you have a very specific field that you want to work in, accounting, medicine, or something where the degree matters. I don't think almost anybody should go to college. My son watches my channel, so I don't want to pull him out too much, but he got a degree to run a division at PayPal and is, then got his CDL so he can make enough money to pay off his student loans, uh, which he did. Once he got his CDL, it took him less than a year to take care of $54,000 in student loans, um, but the degree didn't help him get the job. So it, the GI Bill can be used for trade schools, but you can also just go to those trade schools. I don't know that people, I don't think, okay, so you asked the question. I don't think people should join the military for the benefits of college or trade school or anything. I think they should take advantage of those benefits once they have them. But I think people should join the military to, if, especially if like, if they're like me, I was raised <laughs> by a racist family that felt like they were just outside of society. The best benefit to me of joining the Marine Corps was that was the first time in my life I realized that everybody's the same, that there are good people and bad people in every environment. And, and, and before joining the Marine Corps, I, 
my most of my family is still super racist that you're either Irish or Italian or the enemy. Like those are your two choices. Um, and that would still be, I would probably still be a product of that if I didn't have the exposure to the Marines. So, so there are lots of benefits that come from being in the military that are not college, not trade school. Um, it's, it's the leadership skills. It's the fitting in society skills. Um, yeah. So I would like to see more people join the military. Um, so dangerous question. Thank you. Sean can shine. Do you also provide the washer and dryer for your tenants? I do not. Um, washer dryer hookups are important. I want tenants to be able to have those. But if I have a tenant who applies, who doesn't currently have a washer and dryer, I don't want to supply a washer and dryer because it's more things that can break that I have to maintain. So I have a set, a washer and dryer that is in a shed that the tenants are free to use because a previous tenant left those there. They're not mine. I don't maintain them. I don't replace them if they break. The tenant is welcome to use them until they buy their own washer and dryer. I have had tenants do that. They use them usually two, three months. And then they say, hey, we got it. So I go over there. I drive a 250 pickup. So I just pick that up, put it back in the shed. So I'm not maintaining and I don't have to fix them if they break. Um, but it's easy to get a tenant into your property because it's a little more flexible because they have the cost of moving in, the deposit, the first month's rent, setting up utilities, Maybe they had to rent a uh, U-Haul or something. So they've got all these expenses with moving. I can help alleviate that by letting them use my washer and dryer for a few months until they have the money to, to replace them. So I may be as flexible as I can, but I also try to make it as easy on me as possible because if you watch my channel at all, you know I'm super lazy. So that was a great question. Yes. FL, you have a number. It's beautiful. So is this the Florida man, um, 418107? Is that your Department of Corrections number? Howdy. Would you recommend visiting open houses where you want to invest? If so, what are your good questions to ask the realtor? I would visit open houses, never hurts. The open houses that I've seen are usually on single family houses. So it depends on what you're investing in. I haven't seen very many open houses on small multifamily. They are on the market, off the market that fast. So there's not time for that. It never hurts to talk to realtors or agents, um, but here's something to really file away. A real estate agent and a lender is not your mentor. Even if you find an agent who is an investor, that is not your mentor. Asking questions of an agent, remember, agents and lenders work for tips. I mean, that's, that's not accurate, but they're paid on commission you know, or fees. So their job, the agent's job is to help you buy a property. The lender's job is to sell you a loan product. You might have the chance of running into somebody who has half a clue. So you might get good advice. You might get terrible advice. I have a friend right now who has a lender who's very far up in a large banking institution who is really pushing for my friend to get an adjustable rate mortgage, which is a huge problem for most people. But that lender has a product that they're they are going to get paid more if they get this product to move. So I don't know that I would go and find agents to ask questions unless you're looking for an agent. If you're looking for an agent, uh, I have a video on how to choose an agent. So I would ask questions like, how long does it take you to get back to somebody? And if I tell you to make an offer that is that you don't think is a good deal, would you still make the offer? And if I tell you to make it low, would you do it? Because you want an agent who's going to work for you. They can give you advice, but if they say, I'm not going to make an offer unless it's asking price or higher because right now that's what the market demands. That agent's not going to work for me. The agent does what I ask and can give me their opinion, but they need to do exactly what I ask. So I would ask questions to make sure that that agent is going to do what I want. I also ask, would ask things like, hey, if you were my agent, can you set up an auto search and be aware that I have two or three other agents with auto searches set up and whoever sends me the deal that I like, that's who's going to get the work. I would ask that question because it gives them the chance to say, I only work with people who sign exclusivity agreements and I wouldn't do that. I've never seen that. They realize if you're an investor that they want to get on your, your list because if you find the deal that you're going to go for and it came from them, that's their chance to make money with only the, the time it took to set up the auto search and then never think about you again until you email saying you want to make an offer. So small time commitment for potential reward. Agents who work with home buyers, where the home buyer says, I want to go look at 15 houses and get your opinion. They're taking up so much of the time from that agent. It, it makes sense for that agent to sign an exclusivity agreement because it protects their time. 
Um, but open houses, it can kind of show you the demand. Um, I, I, I don't personally do that, but I don't invest in single family because in my area, I've never seen one that would cash flow other than the one that I bought almost a decade before thinking about becoming an investor. Um, so if I sold it right now, the person who purchased it would lose money if they rented it out. It only makes money for me because I bought it a billion years ago and it's paid off. Um, thank you. So Sean can shine. When you purchase a home with carpeting throughout, do you leave it in, replace it with new carpet, or do you just remove it all and replace it with something else like linoleum or wood? If there are tenants in place, I don't mess with it. Because remember, I buy, I want to buy already occupied places. If it's rent ready, if the carpets are in it and they're nice, I will leave them in until the next tenant, tenant turnover. But I don't like tenants. I don't like properties with uh carpet at all. So whenever I have the option, if it doesn't look new or it needs some kind of work, tear out the carpet, put in LVP flooring, luxury vinyl plank. The only place that I leave carpet is on stairs, less chance for a slip fall. Um, but when possible, I take out carpet and put in LVP flooring. Uh, I live in Washington state and everything gets wet and everything gets muddy and carpet is just gross. So maybe you might live in an area where carpet makes more sense. In our area, LVP with throw rugs is, is much more preferable. I do have one place that has hardwood floors. So I resurfaced the hardwood and left it. Um, and But I'm pretty comfortable with the tenants there. On the next tenant turnover, I might cover the hardwood with luxury vinyl plank because you can only surface hardwood so many times. But if you cover it, then it protects it to where if I was going to move into it, hardwood floors are great. But tenants can tear that up. So I would cover it with LVP. John Mackey, Markey. John, any suggestions for free property management apps? Property management apps. So I use apartments.com to list properties. You can collect rents on there. I used to use Cozy. Cozy was acquired by apartments.com. So apartments.com is free for the owner. There's a $45 application fee when somebody applies to be in your property. And then you can collect payments on there. I've never done that. Um, I'm trying to think of apps that I use. I don't use Stessa. I don't use Hemlane. Um, at, at, I'm going to someday, but not today. Use those apps. And I'll probably try each one out for two or three months to get a feel for it, to figure out which one I want to use. Um, I don't tend to use a lot of apps. Uh, Kiss Principle. I've shown you guys before, and I am making a video soon to like literally break down what each page looks like. This is my entire business. The whole thing would fit into a paper book. Each each property gets 10 pages in there, which I record the mortgage, the current insurance, the tenants when they moved in, what the rate rent rates were, um, when refrigerators were replaced. All of that information is in there. Very simple. I could be anywhere in the world, and I could tell somebody to go to my desk, get the book, look at this property, and tell me what which insurance number is for, you know for whatever i mean i have most of that on digital form too but keep it really simple this can be as complicated or as simple as you make it and for me simple is is a lot easier um, i guarantee there are some really good apps out there that would possibly make it easier for me but self-managing 16 units takes me less than two hours a month and for me that's that's easy enough even for the lazy person Tom, Dion, make an app or let me pay you to manage your property. <laughs> exactly. I don't know that I would want to manage someone else's property because that's a job. Um, and, well, I love the job I have. This is the last job I'm ever going to have in my life. That is a really good feeling to know that that's an actual fact. Ronald, howdy. Howdy, Dion. What is your take on split unit as opposed to central air for a rental? <clears throat> so I live in Washington and none of my units have air conditioning. Um, some use portable units for windows. I have, a, I think, seven out of 16 units have an HVAC system. I don't like it. I like baseboard heat. I know everybody hates baseboard heat and they always say blah, 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 reasons why you don't want it. But in the whole time I've I've owned properties, this is how many times I've had a problem with baseboard heat ever. Um, and my HVAC systems, I have today a $550 bill because they need to go replace an engine because it's making a squeak 
on an HVAC system. If they go and they say, we want to take a look, it's $550. Um, so whenever possible, I would just do baseboard heat. But if you live in an area like the, where a swamp cooler makes sense, my brother has swamp coolers at his California properties. It's out in Rosemont, in the middle of the desert. Makes sense. Um, I would figure out what is used the most in your market so that you have the most access to parts and, and repair services and probably go with that format. That's what I would do. Sean can shine. Have you ever purchased a property that you live in prior to becoming a real estate investor? Yes, I purchased a house. Um, 1999 or 2000, right in there. Um, single family house, white picket fence. Not going to be an investor buying a house to raise kids in. Um, yes, that was my one purchase before becoming an investor. I was I didn't do an investment purchase until like 12 years later. Uh, yep, and then I lost where I was at. Uh, Beto, howdy. Hello, seller wants me to make an offer on a property. We have no access to the inside of property. How do we evaluate? The situation. Uh, the question would be, will you have access after you make the offer? Because it's very common in my area. You can't go take a tour until you're under contract. You have a five to 10 day inspection period where you get to pull out and not lose your earnest money and you get to pick whether it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 days. Um, so that's when I would go do an internal inspection. It's possible that it needs a lot of work. All the drywall can be damaged. All the electric can be bad. It can have knob and tube wiring. It can have bad plumbing. It can have whatever. So depending on the age of the building, um, I would have an inspection clause where you can pull out if you get a chance to go look at the inside because you're going to hire an inspector to go and inspect and then look at the inspection report. Every single offer I've made in the last seven years, I've never gone and looked at the property. I make the offer, get under contract, and then have an inspector go. Most of the time in the beginning, I would go and meet the inspector there. But the last two or three, I'm like, no, nope, I trust my inspector. I'm going to get 72 pages of information with pictures and good write-ups. I'll know what I need. I have like a to-do list once I have ownership of the property. So I would do that, have an inspection period, and use that as the time you go look at the inside and decide if you want to stay or not. So make sure I, I, I don't have the brains to do it, so I wouldn't make that offer. I would have my agent who has all of the paperwork and worked for a brokerage that knows how to get the verbiage right on an appraisal clause and an inspection clause and, and go for, <clears throat> if you it, contact your home inspector to see how much time they're going to need, because if they're super busy, you want to make sure you have enough time to get them in there within the time of your inspection period. Um, but yeah, it's very common in my area to get under contract before you've ever been inside the property. Million. When you inherited a tenant, did you make them sign a new lease? To, so if they're on month to month, I want at least year long leases because it's easier to qualify for lending if you have at least three or more months remaining on a lease. So I don't want month to month tenants. You are bound by the existing lease. So if you bought a per property right now and the lease ended in June, you can't do anything until June. I mean, you probably can at, at request if both parties agree to, to tear up the lease, but you can't force it. Um, when I have month to month tenants, I do not sign a new lease right away. And that's, I didn't get to do a background check on those tenants. So I want two months or so to figure out at least three things. Do they pay on time? Do they call me for super trivial things? And are there noise complaints, right? Those, those three things that really is what I want to know about tenants. If those three things are satisfactory at the two month mark, that's usually when I'll do the new lease. And when I'll use the binder strategy, it gives me that two week, two months to, um, make sure they're tenants I want to keep. And it's given me enough time to replace the coated locks, put uh, motion sensor LED lights on the exterior and ask the tenants if there's anything they want fixed because they usually ask for really small things. And in those two months, it gives them the idea that I'm going to take care of the place, which helps the binder strategy go better. Um, Glenn, howdy. If you're purchasing a house and it doesn't appraise for asking price, do you lose earnest money if you do not have enough to cover the difference? It's de it de depends on the offer that you make. There are some times where people waive their appraisal contingency. Then yes, you either lose your earnest money or you have to make up the difference. Um, I put an appraisal clause in all of my offers. I've never once waived appraisal and I've never in waived inspection. I, I might buy a property and not do an inspection someday. I do them all so far. 
um, because it's a negotiating tool to maybe get the price down and it gives my handyman a, a to-do list. So there's like reasons why I want to do that, but I would never waive the inspection period, like the time, because that's when I get to go in and look at the property or have the inspector look and decide if I want to out for any reason whatsoever, I don't lose my earnest money. So when I submit the offer, I have an appraisal clause, which means if it doesn't meet appraisal by a dollar, I don't have to buy that property and I can get my earnest money back. I would probably match the difference if it was a couple thousand, three, four, five thousand dollars difference in appraisal and they wouldn't come down and then my number still worked. But that's what you do. You have an appraisal clause and an inspection clause so that you don't lose your earnest money. Adam Calhoun, howdy. Royal woman, howdy. Another person who retracted a message and now I'm going to live in wonder and just be stressed out because I don't know what they said. Jay Markey, I left a corporate job I hated, got your CDL, started driving solo and making about 20000 more per year than the job I hated. When I left the police department, I was a police officer. Without overtime, salary was around 50000 So it was a small town. Um, my first driving job that I went to was Oak Harbor Freight Lines, where I was going to make about 115000 that year. So doubled my income to go drive a truck. And then they went on strike because $115,000 a year and great benefits with a pension wasn't good enough for a union. I'm not bitter. Uh, Jones, thanks for being racist. <laughs> I have family members I can't be around because of the terminology that they use. Um, and they're, they're probably good people. They're just racist. It's, it sucks. REI stoners. Howdy. I actually met with some REA stoners recently. A little late, but made it. Gotta say, we are so happy we only use our credit cards for points and pay them off daily. Our trip to all. How about that? <laughs> you changed your name. Our trip to Washington this week was paid by rewards as we keep building them. Awesome. Angel R. Howdy again. Do you use mortgage brokers? Yes. Multiple. So when I do lending, it kind of looks like this. The first several, I would go to Wells Fargo because the larger banks had the most standardized um, criteria and I would know what I was able to borrow. And then once I was under contract and my my broke, my, the person who works for Wells Fargo who told me is the one who told me how to do this. I would then, as soon as we're under contract, go to a bunch of lenders, uh, Fairway Mortgage, Guild Mortgage, local credit union, and say, here's what Wells Fargo has to offer. Can you beat it? get their offer in writing, go back to Wells Fargo and give them a chance to beat it to keep my um, business. My The person there told me to do that. She said, I can't go to my boss and say, I really like Dion. I just want to give him a better rate. She said, if you can go out and find a better rate in writing, I could take that to my boss and say, in order to keep Dion's business, this is what we need to beat. So the first three mortgages went through Wells Fargo because they were able to beat everybody every time. The brokers, Guild, Fairway. And then I found a broker that works with Fairway and my last three deals and two refinances were through Fairway because they were able to beat the rates. But I still go to all of those um, lenders um, every time to see who has the best current rates. And you compare interest rate, closing costs, uh, points to buy down the rate, um, what, you know, compare apples to apples. And I, in the beginning, I didn't really know what all that stuff was. And I might've just confused a few people by saying there's some different fees when it comes to a loan. The lenders knew exactly what to point out. They'll go, hey, we're fifteen hundred dollars less to get your rate lower than what theirs is. So it, it'll it'll cost you fifteen hundred dollars less to beat their rate. So the, the actual first rate, the other lender might have been better, you know, with a lower rate. But to buy it down to the next lower rate, this the first lender was more expensive. So I'd go with the second one. I wouldn't have known to, to do the math on that, but they'll point it out. So. Uh, Jay Markey, do you rent washer and dryer to tenant if they don't have their own? I let them use it because they're not mine. That way, if they break, I don't. If I rented it to them, that is mine. I have to maintain. If I just say this is a washer and dryer that previous tenants left here, I have a tenant that just moved into a, a place not too long ago. I don't want to supply the refrigerator. Same thing. There was a refrigerator there, and I told the tenant, "You're welcome to use it until you get your own. Once you have yours, I'll take this." And it's something a previous tenant left. They might keep it forever. They might never go get their own thing. But when it breaks, I don't have to replace it. Same thing with washer and dryer. Glenn, putting earnest money down tomorrow. Nice. Good. Congratulations. So 
hopefully your offer had that appraisal contingency and in, um, inspection contingency. So you can pull out depending on your offer. So I would check with your agent what your offer was if, if you didn't know that before I was talking about it tonight. Um, some people waive the appraisal and say, I'll cover the gap. And then it could be a very big gap that you need to cover or you just lose your earnest money. Um, and I remember to take it off a of mute. I'm not gonna talk for five minutes on mute. <laughs> Who would do that? Um, Luis Rico, howdy. Uh, I haven't talked to you in a while. How are you? Love your videos. Thank you. I like the one that has Louis Tarico in it. Angel R, your sister just, my sister just had one of her hot water pipes burst and mess up two rooms. Good thing it's a side by side duplex. Exactly. So it impacted one tenant, not both. I went to a friend's house recently who had just closed on a duplex, her first one, super excited, nice rental. And I thought, oh, I'm going to help her do some stuff. And I reached under the sink because we're going to swap out the faucet and I go to turn off the hot water, turn it off outside. Because sometimes when you grab an old faucet or an old valve and it's been in there since the place was made and you go to turn it, the whole thing pops off in your hand and you flood the place. Lesson learned. No good deed goes unpunished. Um, Glenn. Putting earnest money down tomorrow, if appraisal comes back low, do I lose earnest if I decide not to go through with it? Thank you. Not if it's in your offer. If your offer had an appraisal contingency. I think you wrote that after, before I had covered it. So, Sean, howdy. Sorry, I'm a bit late. What's your thoughts on using a home equity line of credit for a down payment on an investment property? I think it's a good strategy uh, under a couple of conditions. First, you have the equity in the house where you're going to do the home equity line of credit, and it's not going to take you up to such a high loan to value that the lender won't do it. Second, will your debt to income ratio handle the addition of a home equity line of credit on the place that you're taking the equity out of and the investment property that you're going to have a mortgage on then because you're using the home equity line of credit for a down payment. So make sure your, your debt to income ratio works because even if you don't take the money out of the home equity line of credit, Lenders will consider that you are making a 1% payment. So if you have a $100,000 home equity line of credit and you take out $20,000 to make your down payment, you don't have the debt to income problem of the $20,000 that you took out. They consider the whole $100,000 that you could take out, 1% of that is in your debt to income ratio as a payment. And I don't like home equity line of credits unless you can pay it off quickly. Like my brother who used home equity line of credits to buy properties and then he focused and paid them off to rinse and repeat and do it again because they usually have adjustable rates. And we don't know what's going to happen to rates in five to 10 years. So you wouldn't want to have a home equity line of credit that lasts a long time. Uh, a couple other things to consider with home equity line of credits. If, if, if lenders have a moment of fear, they might cancel the home equity line of credit. So if you haven't used it yet and, and you were counting on that money as a down payment, you could lose it any day. So if you take the money out, you're then going to pay interest on it. But if you if you have a $100,000 home equity line of credit or a line of credit, and this happened to Matt, the lumberjack landlord, he had 75. So I'm going to use round numbers now. $100,000 thing, and you take out $25,000. That is a 25% loan to value, right? So your credit utilization is 25% of that 100000 if they then cancel the home equity line of credit to where you no longer have access to the 75,000, you don't have to immediately pay back the 25. They don't cancel it, call it in immediately. But since your limit is now 25,000, that home equity line of credit is at a 100% credit utilization rate. So that can have impacts on your debt to income ratio and your credit score. So do you have the ability to pay it off? Can your debt to income ratio handle the added debt of the HELOC and the property that you're investing in. Those would be the things I would consider. Um, and run it by your lender to see if they're okay with it too. Uh, Tom, congrats, Glenn. Yes, congrats. Sean can shine. What made you decide to put your properties and the bank accounts associated with them in your name instead of an LLC? How does it benefit you? I uh, have a very strong opinion when it comes to LLCs. And I'm going to make a video called an LLC rant, but not today. 
I'm waiting and hoping that I get to 10,000 subscribers. Because when I do that video, it's gonna be such a rant that I'm going to piss off a lot of people and I'm gonna lose a lot of subscribers. And I wanna make sure that there's some people left. Because, and I can't say this without, I'm, gonna try to, I'm going to try to say this without emotion creeping into my face. There are times it makes sense to have an LLC. Do you have partners? Because it will protect you from someone else's mistakes. Do you need commercial lending or hard money? Because lenders might require it. There are times it makes sense to have an LLC. There is absolutely no tax benefit by having an LLC. The IRS actually calls them disregarded entities. And there is no asset protection with rental properties if you are the only person or you and your spouse are the only people in the LLC. Piercing the veil is more and more common and it creates all kinds of problems. How do you pay yourself? Lending costs more, insurance costs more, can't represent yourself in court. Like there's this long list of reasons why I don't want an LLC. And the two or three that I named where there is a reason to have an LLC. So, so that was as least amount of motion I can put in there because where I'm so frustrated with this is in bigger pockets, in um, the real estate rookie group and all the Facebook groups, everybody goes off on how you need an LLC because it separates your assets, which is, pardon my French, bullshit. Second, new investors who have enough to learn. How do I find a lease? How do I screen a tenant? How do I collect rents? How do I get lending? How do I find a property? How do I screen a market? Like all this stuff you need to learn. And then you want to sprinkle in learning how to do an LLC. How do you pay yourself? How, how do you run an LLC correctly to where it couldn't have the veil pierced when it, when, when any attorney can do a five minute Google search and just go, yep, that's the person that owns it. All of those assets are tied to it because as soon as you get sued for anything, you have to list out your assets, which is every LLC that you own. So there's no asset separation, but so many people have heard the myth from CPAs and attorneys who get to make money setting up, maintaining and filing taxes on LLCs that they have people convinced that you need one. I'm looking forward to making that video because <laughs> um, it's frustrating. If you have several rentals and you want them in LLCs, go for it. It doesn't hurt you, really, if you know what you're doing. There's no benefit uh, unless you have partners, need commercial lending, or want to use hard money because um, then lenders will require it. But my frustration is I know that there are literally thousands of possible investors who have been stopped in their tracks because they don't have an LLC. Or if they get an LLC, now they can't get lending because they can't house act, can't do owner-occupied lending under an LLC. And if you just buy the property and then think, I'll just put it in the LLC, you can trigger the due on sale clause and cause a whole bunch of problems for yourself. So the people perpetuating the myth of you need an LLC actually make me angry. Um, but like I said, I don't want to do that video until I have enough subscribers to where there's a few of us left after I go on that rant. Um, Hashtag not investing advice. Thank you. Perfect. Because it's not. This is for entertainment value purposes. Carrie, howdy. Currently going through getting a third property with a primary residence loan, and this will be for my mom, but in my wife and I's name. Have you done a loan like this? I, have I done a loan like that? Could have. Um have a, I have two family members that are currently renting units from me. Um, that's actually a side topic I could probably cover if we have time for it. Um, where I could have said, you know, this is my daughter. She's living there. She's renting my place. So uh, it's an owner-occupied loan. Use, use her owner occupancy on the mortgage. Uh, so sometimes people will do that and, and use, you know, that person as a co-signer to get the owner-occupancy requirement for the loan. So you're a co-signer. And so that can get you the lower down payment, the better interest rate. And that person has to live there for at least a year. So it's a good strategy um, with the caveat of what's your relationship like and how is investing going to impact that relationship. Um, if if they're going to get a reduced rent when they live there or, or, or you know, what's the benefit to them? Um, for me, the reason I said it's kind of a side story that I can cover is I would never rent to friends or family when you're starting and you don't have your systems in place. If you don't, know how to get a good strong lease and how to have the backbone to stick to that lease, friends and family will generally take advantage of you. My, my first tenant, it went horribly because I rented to a friend because I didn't think I could trust a, a stranger and we didn't even have a lease. We just did a handshake and everything that went wrong could go wrong. And it was all my fault. I set that up to go wrong. 
now that I have my systems in place and I rent to a, a daughter and a nephew, I'm like, absolutely never had a problem because here's the lease. <laughs> my portfolio could be audited at some point by section eight or the IRS. And so this is when your late fee would be happen. This is the rules and regulations on your driveway. And I can't treat you any different than any other tenant. And they understand this is separate. And, and I, I have that, you know, I'm not going to treat you bad because you're family, but you're not going to get special treatment because you are family. And like I do with all my tenants, I will absolutely teach you how to buy a duplex instead of renting a unit in one. I haven't approached me to do that yet. But yeah, so if you're buying a place and you're using your mom's ability to do owner occupied to get the lending, that is a great strategy as long as your relationship is strong enough to handle it. Um, and you are transparent with lending so you don't commit fraud. You actually say, this is the family member that's living there. All of our names are on the mortgage. Once the year is satisfied, you can do a quick claim and get their name off or whatever the lender will agree to. Um, yes, but I haven't personally done that strategy yet. Michael Smith, howdy, question. Dion, do you ever pay points up front for your loan? Yes, I do. If you're going to to sell a property in a short enough period of time to where the return doesn't justify the expense to buy down the rate, I wouldn't do it. My goal is buy and hold forever until inherited. So I pay now to get the interest rate down as low as possible. Um, and I've done the math. Sometimes it's four years, sometimes it's six years. I will have gotten a return on the amount that it took me to buy down the rate. But if I'm going to have that property forever, I want that lower rate. It helps cash flow. I have the money now to do it. Um, if I was buying with the intent of selling in a shorter period of time, I would not buy down the rate unless it made sense. I'd have to do the math to see if it made sense. But with a buy and hold forever strategy, I like to buy down the rate. Thank you. That was a good question. Uh, North Colorado's on. How is your credit score so high with one card? I have nine cards, less than 10% utilization and six rental loans. And my score is just over 740 putting rentals in my name from LLC, big mistake. So it's one card with like, uh, does it have a limit right now? I had, I had the Amex with no limit, the black whatever card for a while. And now I think Mike, I think the card has a $50,000 limit and I never spend more than a couple thousand dollars on there. So credit utilization is always under 10%, always paid off. Um, Trying to think, think. I, I know for about a year, I watched a bunch of YouTube videos, <clears throat> early Graham Stephan, early minority mindset on how to fix your credit. And I used some of their tools to do that. Um, but in the last couple of years, it just hovers 800 to 780 to 800. I, uh, just closed on a place in May. So open up the Credit Karma app. And I don't think it's sharing any information that's bad. So 789. Does it share? I don't think it shows anything bad, but 789. Uh, so it hovers in that range. It goes back up, and then I buy a place. It drops back down, then it goes back up. <clears throat> so um, early Graham Stefan, early Minority Mindset. They've got some great videos on how to fix your credit. Since my credit score is that low, I, I don't do videos on how to teach you how to do your credit score. Since I'm really happy with my cash flow and making work optional, that's what my uh, videos are intended to do. Um, oh, putting your rentals into an LLC could, could be part of the cause. All of my rentals are in my name, so I have the longevity of the length of the loans. Everything's on auto payments. I don't make early payments or extra payments. Um, Tom, Dion, do you consider other variables when setting rent such as an extra 100 for an extra bathroom or 250 for extra bed so i do base the rents off of bedroom count maybe bathroom count no not really i have two bedroom one baths and two bedroom two baths that get the same rent um section eight pays based on bedroom count only uh, all but one of my properties have garages, so they're pretty much universal there. Most are one-car garages. A couple have two-car garages. One has got like a two-car shop, like a, <laughs> it's an extra building. Um, so I do kind of base off the garage and the bedroom count, not so much the bathroom count. Bathroom count helps demand. 
if you have more than one and a half baths, so if you have two or more bathrooms, you're going to get more families, more parents with kids that don't want to share bathrooms. If you're going to do anything like rent by the room, like Todd Baldwin, then I want multiple bedrooms and multiple bathrooms because the more times you have people that don't have to share bathrooms, the less turnover you're going to have. He's got an excellent strategy and a lot of good videos on that. Um, Uh, I'm trying to think. I don't have anything else that I really use to adjust rents. I did have one tenant ask if I would add a shed. So I spent $3,300 on a shed and we increased the rent by $100. Tenants request, sign a new lease. So sometimes storage could be extra money. So that was like a 30% return on my money for adding a shed. About. Um, Bobo Rex. Howdy. I have a mortgage. If I get a two second mortgage, will that have a higher interest rate? What's the benefits of being a first time home buyer? So the second mortgage, the interest rate can depend on a few things. Is it for something you're going to own or occupy? Because that gets a little, uh, well, it gets you the interest rate. If you're not going to own or occupy, if it's buying it as an investment, you'll get a little bit of an increase to in the interest rate. Is it a single family house or a small multifamily? So a house or a house with an ADU counts as a single family, auxiliary dwelling unit, so two houses, one property, that will get you the mortgage rate. If it's a duplex, triplex, or fourplex, the interest rate will be a little bit higher. So if it's a small multifamily, duplex, triplex, or fourplex that you are not living in, it gets two little increases to the rate. Uh, let me go through your question again really quick. Um, the second mortgage won't, it doesn't mean it'll be a higher rate, it'll depend on what it's being used for. What's the benefit of being a first time home buyer? So a lot of people think FHA means first time home buyer because it has an F and an H in it and that's not it. It's Federal Housing Authority. And it's, that is designed to help somebody who has worse credit score, so a lower credit score and a higher debt to income ratio become a homeowner. And you can use it as many times as you want. You can only have one at a time. So if you have bought a property with an FHA and you refinance out of it, you can use FHA again. If you're buying a single family house, with a conventional loan, and you have not owned a house for the last three years, this makes you a first time home buyer. So if you owned a house five years ago, but sold it, and you haven't owned for three years, you are now considered again, a new virgin. You are a first time home buyer again, because you haven't owned a house for three years. That means a conventional loan would be 3% down if you're going to own or occupy. If you have owned a house, in the last three years, or you currently own a house and you want to buy another single family or house with an auxiliary dwelling unit, so the two houses, that's single family house lending, it's 5% down. So one of the benefits to being a first time buyer is you might get the 3% down instead of five. And some counties or regions have first time home buyer programs where you get so much money towards your down payment from the lending institution or from this program where you might not have any out of pocket costs. So those are some of the benefits to being a first time home buyer. If, if you own or occupy, remember, you're going to get the interest rate. If you don't live there, it's going to be up a little because it's, it's our investment property. So there's a bunch of questions there. So it depends kind of specifically on what your situation is and the type of property you're looking at buying. And so the order of operations to get started in real estate, and I have a couple of videos on my channel, the step, the six steps to get started in real estate or before buying a rental property, what do the first thing is learn how to save. You know, earn as much as you can, spend less than you make to save. Work on your credit score with a target goal of 740 or higher so you can get the best interest rates. Third thing you do, and this is where you're at now, talk to a lender. Find out, this is my living situation. This is the type of investing I want to do. What is your best current loan product? And do they have a first-time home buyer program? Do they, do they even handle that kind of lending? that's where you would start at. All of this happens before you talk to an agent to even set up your auto search to start looking for properties. Carrie, do you have a rental lease template you could send? Maybe. If you're a Bigger Pockets Pro member, you have access to, the, to a lease from an attorney for every state. And I do not have permission to share the leases from Bigger Pockets. But I got my lease from the Washington State uh, Tenant Landlord Resource page. It's no longer there. Don't know why they took it down, but a lot of states have a Tenant Landlord Resource page where they list leases. So my lease isn't going to do anybody any good unless they're in Washington. And even in Washington, they're going to want to tailor it to their property. 
So if you're in another state and I send you a lease from Washington, the rules and regulations might be so different in your state. Your, your, your municipality might even be so different that my lease can cause you legal problems. So I wouldn't want to share my lease with somebody outside of Washington. Um, so if you're in Washington, my email is in the chat. I don't mind sharing my lease. It's a blank template. You literally go into it and it says, uh, you know, this lease is between owner, your name here in all caps. You back that up, put your name in, and then it has a, all that kind of stuff all the way through. But only benefits you if you're in Washington. You want to find one that's for your area. Sean can shine. I've noticed there are a lot of LLC warriors on YouTube. Yes, unfortunately, you will lose subscribers. Sorry for your loss in advance. Yep. But that's the it's the one thing where I think I have a strong opinion on it. Some in some areas, single family house outperform small multifamily. In in some storage sheds outperform rentals. Like there, there's no right way, right? But I do know that telling everybody they have to have an LLC is costing some people even getting started. Carrie, okay, currently using Zillow and it sucks. <laughs> there you go. Apartments.com, I think, has leases if you pay for their pro membership. I've never, I just use the free version. Um J. Mackey, Dion, do you include a pet fee in your lease? I do, and you worded it right. It is a pet fee. I charge a one-time pet fee at move-in of $250 and then a $25 a month pet fee. So if they have a snake in an aquarium or something like that, I don't. But if it's a cat or a dog or something that is going to do damage to the house or could do damage to the house, I charge those fees. Do not charge a pet deposit by definition, a deposit is refundable. So you can't do a non-refundable pet deposit. That's not a thing. The, the legal terms counter contradict each other there. Actually, something I learned from Mindy Jensen in my little book of Mindy Jensen quotes. It's a pet fee because fees aren't refundable. A non-refundable pet deposit is refundable um, unless you can justify that there's something wrong. So I do uh, do that. But I do like to allow pets. It increases demand because a lot of places just won't let pets go in. So they're not even on the list of options for some of the tenants that I have. And like I said earlier, one of the things, one of the strategies that I use to help limit tenant turnover is to allow pets because people don't like to relocate a pet. Rob, are your kids buying rentals? Yes, I have three kids and one of them is on track to buy a rental in the next year or two. They are... They first eliminated student loan debt and all consumer debt. So, and the, uh, at the same time, while they're saving their down payment for their first duplex. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely going to be handholding, walking through the whole process and uh, looking forward to that. Steve, howdy. Okay, you don't like LLCs, but what about a trust? Absolutely, you, you trusts have a benefit. Uh, LLCs have a benefit if you have partners, or need commercial or hard money. So there are times it makes sense. Totally get it. My nonprofit is in an LLC. My CDL school is in an LLC. My rentals, no. But I trust because of the tax benefits for your inheritors. And 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 yes, that has a benefit. So definitely recommend a trust. Uh, depending on the size of your portfolio, the cost to do that can be a couple thousand dollars. Totally worth it. But mortgages and properties and everything you know, if you're not worried about inheritance, your own name, putting in a trust is the way to go. Um, how do you grow your network? I don't want to say I disagree with Michael Zuber or Matt the Lumberjack Landlord. Um, there are some things that we disagree on. They have recycled capital. I recycle cash flow. So I haven't recycled capital yet. Their portfolios are much bigger. They're much more successful. But my goal isn't a big portfolio. My goal was to make work optional and have some generational wealth for my kids. I've done that. And Michael Zuber really talks about growing your network. Two to four people a week, more people that might bring you deals. I, And people say things often where your network is your net worth because it sounds catchy. Um, I did this. N no mentor. Uh, I tripped, fell on my face several times, educated myself on YouTube. Um, 
I use the lender that has the current best whatever. I use multiple agents for my auto search. I don't have a go-to network of that's my agent, that's my lender. Um, I do like to grow my network of finding handyman, local Facebook groups, a local REI meetup. So you can go and get like a face-to-face -face review from people on what the handyman's job is like or work is like. Um, I use the Thumbtack app to find contractors because I don't do rehabs or, or constantly, you know, doing the burr method. So when I, it's me, I, it's like one time I need a fence worked on and I won't need a fence worked on again for 10 years. So I don't have a contractor for fences. I have the Thumbtack app to find contractors, get quotes and read reviews. Um, my mental network, I uh, have grown on YouTube by interacting with people like Michael Zuber, Todd Baldwin, Millennial Mike, April Crosley, Lumberjack Landlord, Matt the Lumber, Matt the Mortgage Guy, like, like getting to interact with them and make videos and, and like it pushes my boundaries. That's something that's good. So if you're going to local REI meetups and you're talking to investors who invest, they might not be your network or who you get deals from, but expanding the way that you interact is really important. It's rule number seven on Michael Zuber's rules of one rental at a time. It's growing your network or some or something like that. That the people the people you hang out with like really matter. If you're if you're hanging out with people, like if I go to my hometown in California, which I'm not going to do, never going back. Um, told my mom, you want me at your funeral? You're going to have to come to Washington and die. Uh, the same people are probably sitting on the tailgate of a pickup on a dirt hill in the middle of nowhere getting drunk every weekend because that's what they do. If I if I hung out with people like that, I probably wouldn't be making investment strategy moves and, and learning these kind of things. So hanging out with people that are doing what you want to do is very important. So I don't know that it's growing your network as much as, as shifting your network. And it's really hard to say this because you can't see where the comma is, but you can't change the people around you but you can change the people around you. Uh, so to grow your network, I would start looking for people who are into investing, who like the asset class that you're investing in and who are open to talking about it, which I find in real estate, it's, it's, a, it's a lot easier to get people to talk than to get them to shut up. <laughs> um, which is why one of the reasons why I have this channel and I really appreciate everybody coming to the live streams because in my daily life, I interact with hundreds of people every week, which is weird because I'm an introvert and not a people person. And almost, almost none of them care about money or financial freedom or real estate or anything. So this to me is, is, is a very important interaction. Um, sometimes the questions that people ask help me articulate a thought that I had that now when somebody says, you know, when I first started investing, people would say, well, what do you want? I would go, I want a property that makes money. Now I literally can give like a 45 second, this asset class with this return, with these aspects in this type of area for these reasons, because I've answered questions that people ask, it's down to a science that's second nature. And I have some memory issues. So making things second nature was huge for me. So that's what I think of network. Uh, that's a, oh, howdy. So how do you keep your personal account separate from your real estate accounts? Why would you? There's no reason to, none whatsoever. Uh, so I have one savings account. I know that $30,000 of that mentally is my reserve. As it grows, that the rest of that is my money for investing. So as that money grows, I know that mentally $30,000 is reserved. The rest is there. There is no reason to separate accounts unless you have an LLC. If you have an LLC and you commingle any itty bitty tiny little bit of your finances, your LLC no longer means anything. So then it would matter. You can make this as complicated or as simple as you like. I like simple because of the lazy. So I don't keep my accounts separate. I know exactly. I have a spreadsheet that has this rental. These are the expenses associated with it. These are the notes. These are the dates. And then I write down bigger things in my book. But that spreadsheet, I can click. I can make it by date. I can make it by... Um, property. I, I know exactly where the expenses are, what was spent. So I can look and go, this is how much my house in Yelm made in 2019. And this is how much it cost. So how did that asset look by itself? I could do all that just with an Excel spreadsheet. So the accounts themselves don't need to keep separate. Don't need to keep separate. I am disappointment in my grammar. Um, but one checking account, one savings account, one credit card, super simple. 
check your local area. Remember, read the disclaimer. <laughs> you might have to keep deposits in a separate interest-bearing account. Um, okay. John W. When asking a bank for a pre-approval, do you tell them it's for a rental property investment? You tell them if it's investment or owner occupied because that's going to tell you what your interest rate is going to be and what you can borrow. For instance, if you're using FHA, uh, you know, jumbo loans had a limit that in November went up, became a higher limit. So it tells you how much you can borrow. So that pre-approval can be based on whether you're going to live there, owner occupied, or it's going to be an investment property. So yes, tell them what your plans are. G. Boland, howdy. How do you get my hand on your system? How do I get my hand on your system? Um, I, I put everything on YouTube and I try to do 10, 10 minute videos whenever possible. I have a video coming up Thursday, 23 minutes long. I tried, this is as short as I can get it. This guy just had a mountain of information and I tried to get it down to the stuff that was the most useful. Um, but the videos are all there. I have a playlist called Tired of Selling Your Life One Hour at a Time. That's the playlist to go through. I don't have a course because I'm really trying, I'm trying not to monetize this. Um, I mean, I'm not stupid. I'll make money, you know, have YouTube ads turned on because then I control what type of ads there are. If you'll notice, none of the commercials in my ads are the ones you can't skip. So you can skip. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to monetize so I can control which ones they are. But I, I haven't done a book, I haven't done a course. I don't charge to have phone calls or you know answer email questions or something. It's there's there's so much free content. I don't think people should pay thousands of dollars for a course. So to get my system, it, it every Tuesday, come with your questions. Um, maybe ask a question and I, I email me. My email's in the chat. I can send you a specific video if you can't find it on, on whichever system you're trying to learn. My goal is to share this with as many people as possible and make it simple. It's ironic for my system to work for me. It had to be simple. Um, let me see. Sky blue crafts. Howdy. Thank you. Chandler's rental calculator includes money for repairs, but how do you determine what to offer on a property if you aren't? sure on the hidden repairs that might be needed best guess best guess based on age of the property um you're going to do an inspection during the time period when you have an inspection uh, clause so that you can pull out if the, the work ends up being too much um bigger pockets has a book how to estimate rehab costs but it it that's more once you own a property this is how to uh best guess certain things um, practice, the more you do it, the better. And sometimes using a rental calculator app or using the bigger pockets, rental calculator systems, find somebody with an investment property and say, or if you own your own house or you own an investment property, run the numbers on a known. Somebody who has a rental property, go to them and say, look, I found, I, I want to run the numbers on your property and I want to see what my return would be. And then I want to share those numbers with you and you tell me how close I got and they'll be able to say, it was great, except here's the things you forgot, or here's the things you missed, or here's why it ended up being better. Um, and that's the easiest way. It, it's hard to use a rental calculator app on something you're not sure about because you can make mistakes and not know it. But if you can use the calculator apps or the, the estimator apps on something you know the outcome of, or the other person knows the outcome, and then take your data and show them and see if they say how close you were, that's the easiest way. And the more you practice, like learning your market, you can't learn a market in a week. You haven't seen enough deals come on and off to see what's actually happening. Learning a market takes 60 days, 90 days, something like that. The more you run the numbers, the more data that you have to go off of, the more it becomes second nature. But it does start best guess. That was the best way to end that. Hip Harp One, Silver, howdy. I stay local within 30 minutes drive of my home. It is good to have your local attorney to write a lease for you. Yes, so you can have an attorney write the lease because they know the local rules. Um, one of the things I do is my CPA is from another state. 
taxes are kind of not really area specific as usually, but anything legal, I'm not hiring an attorney who lives in Georgia to do something in Washington. I'm going to find an, an attorney generally from that county to handle any of the things that I have here. So that's a good idea. North Colorado Dawn. Have you heard of move in fee versus security deposit? I've heard of it. Um, apartment complexes will do it. Um, check your local area. Some places don't allow move-in fees. They don't allow non-refundable deposits and they don't allow cleaning expenses. Like you can't, in some areas, you can't say there's a $300 cleaning cost and here's your deposit. Um, so know the local areas to know what's allowed. Considering changing over to the move-in fee. If it's allowed in your area, it, it, it's good. I kind of like the deposit because it motivates the tenant to leave the place in a good, as good a condition as they can, because there is an opportunity for them to get some of their money back. Um, North Cal or NCAL, I'm guessing North Cal, North Cal. Howdy. If you get sued, what protection do you have to limit liability and protect your assets without an LLC? Because there is absolutely no LLC, there are no, no protection for your assets in an LLC unless you have partners. Depending on situation, some lawyer might target all of your personal assets. Is this correct? Absolutely. Even if you had it in an LLC, an attorney is going to target all of your assets. Great question. Insurance. So there's three things, if I can remember them. I know there's three things. I don't know if I'll remember them because I have memory issues. The first one. Insurance. So you have property insurance on the property, on each property with up to 300,000. This is what I do up to $300,000 for injury. So if somebody's injured on the property up to $300,000, full replacement value on the property. Then when you have one or two properties, that's probably enough. I didn't do this till I had four properties, probably should have done it at three. I got an umbrella policy where I have an insurance policy on me to where if I'm ever sued for anything and it goes above the amount of the insurance on the property, then the umbrella policy is, is, is triggered. I have a $2 million policy, which cost me about 500, I think it went up like 590, $590 a year for $2 million in, in, in coverage for myself. So that's the first thing is insurance. The second thing for asset protection is leverage. The banks are in first position on six of my seven properties. So if I'm ever sued, I take those properties because the banks have first right to them. And the third thing, fix things. Do walkthroughs, check the banister, um, have it in your leases that tenants are responsible for clearing snow or uh, pine needles from the driveway or whatever the, the, the threat to that area might be. Or if you live in an area where like Matt the Lumberjack Landlord is where it's it's an ice age for two months out of the year, um, actually hire the people to come and clear and do the snow clearing or whatever. So that's the three things. Insurance, leverage, be proactive. Um, there is no asset protection. If you have 10 rentals and you have them in 10 LLCs and you own those LLCs, those are all your assets and you will name them all if you're ever sued. And any attorney who was smart enough to graduate college, pass the bar, can do a five minute Google search to figure out who owns those LLCs. And that is not a separation of assets in rental properties. It is for a business. It is for some other asset classes, but not for rental properties. Piercing the veil is more and more common. So you are totally welcome to go have an LLC, but also do those three things, even if you have LLCs. Uh, Larry, do you fully take max depreciation or do you suggest taking enough depreciation to small loss, small loss on tax return and maintain being more lender, lender able for future deals? Close, really close to what I do. I always take max depreciation not this bonus that we've had the option to in the last couple of years, but max depreciation, because if you ever sell, it is assumed that you used max depreciation. So depreciation recapture happens whether you take it or not. So I do that. I don't take all my write-offs. If, if I buy something for a rental property, I am not required to write that off. So I do want to show just a small loss on my rental property. So in 10 years, I've never paid a penny in rental income tax. So even in, in last year's, we're, we're doing $128,000 in profit. I won't pay a penny in income tax on the rental income tax. On my W-2, I pay all the taxes. Um, 
So I don't play with the depreciation. I play with the write-offs. It probably could work to play with the depreciation too. I just tell my CPA, make me, and I call it bankable. So if I'm bankable, that's because I'm not showing a huge loss, but I'm not showing a profit to have to have a tax obligation legally. Tom, you're called a self-proprietor. Exactly. Even if you have an LLC, those are pass-through entities, you are still called a self-proprietor. Rob, the 30K reserve is based on what? The lazy. Some people go, what is my uh, net worth? I need this much in reserves, so 3%, 4%, whatever. Uh, how many doors do I have? I want to have $5,000 per door, wh whatever the metric is. For me, it's when I had seven do doors or less, the odds of all seven not paying their rent is really small. The odds of one or two not paying their rent is pretty good. Uh, not good, but it's possible. Uh, the odds of three roofs going bad at the same time, pretty small. The odds of a water heater failing, pretty good. 10,000 can cover pretty much all of the problems that I would have. Once I had more than seven doors, Murphy's Law is if something can go wrong, it will. Murphy's fourth corollary is if a sequence of events can go wrong, they will, and in the worst possible order. Once I had more than seven doors, I didn't think 10,000 would cover it, and I didn't want to do something confusing like what is a percentage of my net worth or gross net worth, gross worth, gross net worth. I'm disappointment in my grammar again. Um, and I didn't want to do something like a per door count. But $30,000 while I work at W-2 is plenty to handle one or two roofs going out at the same time, a foundation issue, several units not paying rent. As soon as I have more units, I'm probably raising to 50,000 as I just have more units, more things can go wrong. And if, I ever not, if I'm ever in a position where I don't have a W-2 income, then I'm going to increase that probably double from wherever it's at just to give that um, swan, that sleep well at night account. So that's what it's based on. Super simple, super lazy. That works good for me. Lenders have been okay with the 30,000. So also lenders want you to have a certain amount in reserves anytime you go for the next loan. And so far, they've been okay with that. So, so you don't keep one account for personal and second for real estate, just have a barrier, a mental barrier. One checking account, one savings account, one credit card. That's it for 16 rental units and still working um, and running a nonprofit. Um, yeah. So it's just KISS principle. Keep it simple. Danielle McCalla. Howdy. McCalla. Hi, Dion, and thank you for your teachings. Thank you. I have learned a lot over the course of a year. Do you have specific books that you recommend new real estate investors? I do. Um, and I have it saved in notes. Um, no, that's podcast and books. So that would be too much information. Um, one rental at a time. It's easy to duplicate. It's right off the MLS. It's traditional lending. You can then, once you have the basics, make, make it as complex or confusing as you want. Rich Dad, Poor Dad and cash flow Quadrant. Um, the Most of the Bigger Pockets books, I'm pretty good. Mindy Jensen and Scott Trench did one, and I'll probably butcher the name, but it's something like a first-time home buyer something, and that book breaks down all kinds of strategies. I've actually given that book away a couple times on my channel. I've given away one rental at a time several times too. Um, I'm trying to think of what other real estate books. Mindset books, obviously, Think and Grow Rich. Um, what is that, Napoleon Hill? And then Richest Man in Babylon. Those are mindset books that I would I would recommend going through. Uh, that should be a good start. Rich Dad Poor Dad is good for mindset. doesn't have an instruction with it at all. It doesn't help you narrow down your asset class. It tells the difference between assets and liabilities and kind of gets your mindset right. Cash flow quadrant is great. As soon as you understand the four quadrants of, of taxes, you realize that Employees are penalized and investors are rewarded. There's a reason why we want to go to the investor quadrant. Um, so that's a really good book to go off of. Um, so that's kind of my short list recommendation. 
um, REI stoners. Do you give some sort of credit or gift card to tenants that pay on time and keep the property up? I have not done that. Um, what have I done? I have good communications with them. I, I, I do ask every now and then if there's anything that they would like fixed so that I can stay on top of small things that they might not think is important enough to, to note. But if I have the time, I can send a handyman out there and fix something to make sure they know I want to be proactive. Um, using the binder strategy keeps tenants happy because they actually understand what they would be paying somewhere else and they understand they're getting a good deal. Um, but I haven't done gift cards or that kind of stuff. Um, I would be hesitant to do it unless you did it to every tenant. And some tenants might not like that because if you did it to some and not others, you set yourself up for discrimination. Um, no, I, th I think the biggest gift that I give my tenants, <laughs> I leave them alone. Um, especially if they pay on time and keep the place nice, I don't bother them. Don, you're an introvert. Wouldn't have guessed that. I think you could sell a fish, a bicycle. Appreciate the enthusiasm in your content. Thank you. I'm absolutely an introvert. If it, it, uh, I N T J. So the, of the 16 personalities, um, would definitely sit home and read a book preferred to going to a party. And if I go to a party, I would want it to be a function where I'm the speaker because that way I'm facing everybody and there's nobody behind me. Um, yeah. Uh, in the Marine Corps, you have the family of the Marines, right? So you, but everyone else is, it's, it's, it's us and them. They're, everyone else is a them. In law enforcement, you have a vest and a gun and a badge between you and everybody. Um, as a truck driver, you're literally in the truck educating yourself with audiobooks and podcasts by myself. Um, and this, while this is probably the most interaction I get all week, as far as like actually communicating with people other than like at work for work function, <laughs> but there's a camera and an internet between all of us. Um, so definitely an introvert. Another reason why real estate works great for me. I I'm house hacking a unit in my fourplex where I've seen the neighbors probably three times in the whole year of 2021. Uh, very okay with that. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't people I don't like. I'm just, I'm just not much of a people person. It might be a law enforcement thing. There's, there's a metric of in every 100 people, there are two sociopaths and one psychopath. So sociopaths will hurt you and know better the psychopath or the, the, in a city, there's a lot of 100s. So the more people there are, the more chances of running into the real crazies. Uh, so not a people person. REI trainer. Howdy. Hopping on a little late. Have you had anyone take you up on an owner financing yet? How many offers have you made with this strategy? 10-year treasury hit two-year high today. Fun stuff for rates. Yeah, the rates are going to be interesting. I still have my bet going where I think and by June they're going to be down. I think... They're going to talk high rates. It's going to it's going to increase demand. People are going to think, I, if you're, if you're missing out, I better get in now before rates go up. It's going to increase demand. Government fears deflation more than inflation, so I think that's going to cause rates to go down. I've only made one owner occupy or one seller financing because I put my buying on hold while my friend was buying a duplex, and I walked her through all of that. And then I'm saving up a down payment because I'm putting my money where my mouth is, and I want my next property to actually cost have a purchase price of more than a million dollars because the thing I say often is I wish my properties cost more. In my first years of investing, I kept trying to buy the cheap property that I can afford. And Michael Zuber says it all the time. You can go broke buying cheap. If the return scales, I want to buy a more expensive property because as the return scales, that means more money. So I've been saving up a down payment and not really making offers. I'm looking for that next fourplex three bedrooms each unit, a garage for each unit, side by side in Washington. I will be making every offer going forward. I will make an owner uh, owner financed and a traditional lending offer at the same time. I did that once and it was accepted. Uh, and then it fell through, what was it? They had, they had a mortgage left a little bit more than the down payment that I could afford to do. Because with seller financing, my down payment needs to be the amount the person needs to walk away with so that whatever mortgage they have is left is gone. And the amount for the agents. 
because the seller, in my opinion, I have better luck doing a seller finance deal if the seller is not writing a check to sell their property. So I want the down payment to be whatever they need to take care of for their lending, get the down payment that they would like to get, cover the agent fees, and then do the rest. So that, that one fell through. Um, so I've made one and it was accepted. And it was like this, I was like 20,000 off of making it work. Um, so I'll be making those going forward. Uh, Sean can shine. Do you have any videos about the umbrella policy you mentioned or any videos about getting liability insurance in regards to your property? Thank you for all your questions, for answering all of our questions. Um, thank you for asking the questions. I am making a video in the next couple of weeks about insurance and I, it's going to, it's going to irritate. Like, so when I make an, an a, a video on things to ask a real estate agent or how to get lending, my real estate agent friends call me pissed off and my lender friends call me pissed off. Um, when I make the insurance one, people who work in the insurance industry are going to call me pissed off or email me because I'm going to oversimplify it. It doesn't need to be complicated. This is what insurance looks like from the perspective of the investor. That person working in the industry knows the terminology, knows what the rates and how the rates are found and all the, all the things that actually matter to them that I don't care about. Do I have the coverage I want? What's the best way to get the best rate for that coverage? That's the video I'm making. So I'm not going to use the right technical terminology and I'm not going to use, I'm not going to promote the insurance packages that the brokers want to sell. I'm going to promote the one that worked for me. I am making that video soon, but not today. Um, REI trainer pulled a message back and it's going to make me wonder all night long. Raj M. Howdy. In a single family home, a good uh, is a single family home a good place to start for first time buyer investor. Market dependent. I wanted to start with single family houses, but in my market, they don't cash flow. It's been 10 years now. I've still never seen one that would cash flow. So I went to small multifamily. I have a friend who lives here in Washington. She invests in Ohio and she buys single family that cash flows and gets the return she's looking for at a distance with a property manager. So depending on your market, single family or small multifamily or whatever makes the most sense to you. My suggestion, because it's always my go-to, is going to be to house hack. Lower down payment, better interest rate. All the benefits that come with lowering or reduce, uh, reducing or eliminating your housing expenses to be able to save more to invest sooner. It's not required. It's just my go-to. This is what worked for me. This is what works for most of the people that I know. But if you have a good income, good debt to income ratio, have the ability to save a down payment, makes just as much sense. Makes just as much sense to buy an investment property first. Um, so what works in your market, what would have the best yield? Michael Zuber says it great. So I'm gonna make sure he gets credit. He would buy a single family house, a small multifamily house, or an apartment complex based on which one had the best yield. And yield is, um, see if I can do this in less than 30 seconds. Annual profit divided by cost to acquire. Cost to acquire is down payment, closing costs, and immediate repairs. Annual profit is the money left after all expenses and setting aside for vacancy repairs and maintenance in a year. Yield. Which one has the best yield? Does make sense to start with a single family, but you might have a different asset class in your area that works better. House with an ADU. So two single family houses on one property. Works like a duplex, but qualifies for all single family lending. Up to four units qualifies for residential loans, which is 30 year fixed rate debt. Can be house hacked, can be owner occupied. So you have a lot of uh, your personal situation matters and the area you are investing matters. That was a good question. Thanks. Um, Raj, hello from Atlantic City, New Jersey. Howdy. If you're investing in New Jersey, something to consider is the uh, property taxes. Make sure you're factoring those in. A lot of times investors will make the mistake of buying a property, looking at the MLS or Redfin or Zillow or whatever place you found the property taxes and thinking my property taxes in New Jersey are $10,000 a year. And then you buy the property, which creates a factual event for your county tax assessor at the value that you purchased it. And now your taxes are $18,000 a year, which can have a huge impact on your cash flow. So depending on your area, 
I know that New Jersey has high taxes as for property taxes. California actually has lower property taxes than most states. Um, Washington has average uh, where Matt, the lumberjack landlord invests, property taxes are pretty high. But remember, when you purchase a property, it creates a factual event that can reset the property taxes to a new value. Run your numbers off of what that number would be. And the way to do that is sometimes contact your county and say, how are taxes calculated here? And if it goes off of current value, 1%, 3%, whatever their percentage is, you can actually run the math at this purchase price, this would be my taxes. Robo Rex, Dion, I have a credit score of 750 and savings of 20,000, including the emergency funds here. I am looking for investing in single family homes since multifamily are too expensive in my area. I am currently analyzing homes. Cool. If you were to house hack a small multifamily where you did an owner occupied loan, you can do FHA and do 3.5% down on all the way up to a four unit. So if they're more expensive, remember more expensive doesn't mean worse deal. I'm looking, I'm specifically looking to buy a more expensive small multifamily because the yield scales, which means more money. Um, and I just did a video recently where I purchased a property in 2018 for $298,000. A friend just closed on a duplex in November, uh, six houses away for $555,000. And I prove in that video that her deal for this almost the same duplex at twice the price was a better purchase than mine. Mine's a better purchase now with three years four years of history and rent increases and refinancing and all that kind of stuff. But first year to first year without, you know, we don't have the crystal ball. Not all of us has the crystal ball to know what's going to happen with interest rates and rents. But that first year to first year, hers is a better deal, even though it costs twice as much as mine almost. Um, yeah, but sounds like you're in a good position. So, uh, Robo Rex, you mentioned I should be talking to lenders. Besides that, what else do you recommend I should be doing to get my first investment property? So um, the video on my channel is called Before Buying a Rental, What Do? Grammar that I borrowed from my daughters. Uh, save, learn how to save. The more money you have for down payment, closing costs, immediate repairs, and reserves, the more options that open up to you. Keep working on your credit score. Talk to lenders. Once you have that down, you're going to work with an agent because hopefully by this time, you're going to choose a strategy. You're going to wholesale, flip, burr, buy and hold, short-term rental, long-term rental, local, at a distance, storage shed, RV pad. What, what strategy are you going to use? Now you talk to a lender to set up your auto searches and you study your market. 15, 20 minutes every day, look at a couple of deals. Figure out the area average rents because that's going to be how you calculate the yield. Price is only a, like a third of the metric. You have price, interest rate, rents to determine what your yield is going to be. I mean, there's more like age of building, that kind of stuff. But those are the three main categories. You study the area by going to apartments.com, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, and looking for rentals of two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom in your area to figure out get a good grasp on the areas that get a better rent. What's renting better? Is it, is it places with garages? Is, is it places with pools, depending on what part of the country you're in? What, what matters in that area? Just study it for two or three months while your agent has that auto search or your agents have auto searches set up to, to where you can just keep learning your market. Join local REI meetup groups. Keep watching one rental at a time. The Lumberjack Landlord, uh, Dion Talk Financial Freedom. I would check him out. It's all right. Come on the Tuesdays for the live stream with your questions and, and just keep doing a little bit every day. Don't set aside five hours on a Saturday uh, because you'll miss all the deals that come during the week and you'll probably be productive for two hours on a Saturday out of those five. But if you do 15 to 20 minutes every single day to learn your market, the more you run the numbers, learn how to use the CDS rental calculator app, or if you're a Bigger Pockets Pro member, they're rental calculators um, to learn how to figure out what your yield would be. Uh, interact with other investors who are doing the strategy that you want to do. Uh, that would be like the starting process for your first 60 to 90 days. It gives you plenty to work on. The books don't hurt. Um, one rental at a time, cash flow quadrant, those kind of books. Uh, let's see. 
Danielle McCullough. Thank you, D, for the book recommendations. Thank you. REI Trainer. Tip. Pay your credit card bill balance in full in the middle of the cycle and then pay full balance day before it prints and you will have a zero balance or less due on the next statement. Zero utilization. Been doing it for years. That's a great strategy. I have memory issues, so I would never know what day of the month it is. So my app, every single day, whenever I have a payment or have an expense, I just pay it off. Uh, same thing. Never carry a balance, never hit the 10% credit utilization. Uh, and it works for my memory. Jay Marky Dion, thanks for the wisdom. Got to run. Ciao. Tom. And chat. I leave it at 1% utilization for reporting to credit bureaus, then pay that balance. But yes, always. So I've kind of had a debate with somebody recently, and I reached out to a couple of people that I think have more knowledge than me. In the early 80s, having some money on your credit mattered. It doesn't now. It Because the monthly thing shows the activity. It shows if it was ever above 10%. It shows if it was ever used at all. We used to actually, people would say, actually carry a balance. You want some money carried one month to another. And now people are saying that you can pay it off every day and it still shows. And like I said, it might work more. There might be people with 830 credit scores or something, but keeps mine hovering around 800. So, RA trainer, I balance between ENTP and INTP. Interesting you end in J, but it just makes sense why you work in law enforcement, <laughs> right? Uh, Tony Carr, howdy. If you couldn't find a multifamily home one to four in your area for a year or so, would you change your strategy to single family or other yield works in your area? I would, um, if I couldn't find it for a year, I would start expanding out a little bit further, maybe driving an hour and a half instead of an hour. You, uh, I think you're missing an asset class if you look for two to four units, small multifamily. I still haven't seen single family that even come close to cash flowing here. Like, like they would all, the best one I saw would lose like $500 a month. Um, but a house with an ADU, an auxiliary dwelling unit, I would add that to your search. The numbers work like a duplex, but you don't get as many investors because most forget to add that to their search. ADU, DADU, granny flat, mother-in-law house. You don't know which colloquialism they're going to use in your local market. So I would list all of those to see if they show up. Homeowners don't want it because they don't want tenants. So they're not looking for two houses. So you kind of limit the pool of people you're competing with. So I would add that to it. And then concentric circles, just keep looking out further and further until you find the market that works. Michael Zuber, it, it's it's two and a half hours away because he's in Sacramento and he invests uh, two and a half hours away. So he just kept going out until he found the market that made sense. Yep. Cool. Uh, REI trainer, Dion, you always give great perspectives. Thank you for your time. As always, good luck on the seller financing. I'm also implementing that strategy. Let's do it. Awesome. Yes. Hopefully you've gotten my seller financing letter with the stuff that I've I put in there. Matt, the lumberjack landlord. Of course, he takes back comments. So now I have to wonder what that was. <laughs> Come on, contact. Only 67 likes, people. Nice. There, are there really 67 likes? Holy crap. Thank you, everybody. That is amazing. Appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. And welcome to the chat. Jones O. I do not want to do a CDL school, all that money, because I don't have it. If I find a trucker with a golden heart for the seventh, I should be good to go. Learn and but there are some states where training is not required. So you don't want to come to Washington, like somebody said earlier. In Washington, it, school is a requirement, 160 hour course certified by the state. Um, there are some states where you just need to learn, have a truck to take the test, and you can get your CDL. It's a little harder to find a job because a lot of companies want to see that 160 hours of training, but it's not, it's not a deal killer. Thank you, 68. Cool. I, I do appreciate the likes. That's cool. And like I said, if you don't like me and you just hate it, hit the dislike button twice. Let me know you hate me. Um, because I can't take twice. Like twice. Thank you. Oh, and if you want some um, Russian porn, there's a little link there. That one's a, do you have a CDL channel? I do not. Um, no. Um, I have three videos on this channel that help the CDL school. The 
how to market yourself, which works for anybody who has resume issues, the hidden job market, which is how we're successful as a CDL school and how we help people find non-driving jobs, and then interviewing mistakes. Those are the three that we use for the school. Um, the Helpful Trucker is a great YouTube channel to get truck driving information from. The Helpful, H-E-L-P, Helpful Trucker. Um, that guy knows his stuff and, and has good content. So I am in this... Uh, format, financial freedom, financial independence. Um, that's my passion. I, I, I run a nonprofit that helps people find non-driving jobs. I run a CDL school where I get to play in trucks like they're a go-kart and I help people find local driving jobs. And I like that, but I love the idea of helping people make work optional. So I help people find jobs and then I teach people how to make the job optional. So I don't have a trucking channel. Um, Walk by faith and budget. Howdy. With the owner finance deal, you had the down payment and reno costs up front. I did, but I didn't have enough to cover the, the they had like 187 or something thousand in a mortgage. And I had basically had that, but I didn't have that and the agent fees, which is what I would have needed. And I don't do renos. I buy places that are rent ready or already occupied. That place needed like maybe a thousand dollars worth of work. Um, so, yes, I had that up front. REI Trainer. Credit card companies only report the utilization based on the credit card statement, but they can report that to the Bureau at any time. They usually batch them together, and that's why it isn't always consistent. Nice. Raj M. I've got to put the time in learning the market. Thanks. Yes. Once you learn the market, it, it gets easier and easier, and then you can actually track trends from 2014 to 2019 rents here in my area kind of went nice and then 2020 and 21 they went hockey stick and if i wasn't watching my market every day i would be missing out on tens of thousands in rent increases because i went and did the binder strategy i it dawned on me there is so much rent increases going on it doesn't make sense to do a five percent increase it makes sense to go and have a conversation with the tenants and let them know what's going on and let them choose what the new rent is, which ended up making tens of thousands of dollars for me because I was watching the market. So not only is, does it help when you're buying, it helps how you adjust your rents. Kay Walker, howdy. Hey there, there's an area I am really interested in investing in MDI. Haven't pulled the trigger yet because the research doesn't support my inclinations, but I think it's a good move. Help. Well, uh, help. I am putting out the content and I'm here to answer questions. That that question that comes up often, it came up today, I think, in the One, one Rental at a Time channel on our group on Facebook. How do you get past the analysis paralysis? Because it is easy to just keep looking at the market and never take action. My fear is money sitting in a bank. I'm missing out on cash flow. I'm missing out on appreciation on four times what I invest. I'm missing out on principal pay down. I'm missing out on all the tax benefits. So I can collect 0.02% interest. If you, if you start fearing that, it's a lot easier to take action. Because even if you kind of mess up and you get a 2% return instead of a 10% return, 2% is bigger than 0.02%. And what you learn from an okay deal in the beginning is way more than a thousand hours of podcasts or books. Um, I'm not saying go out and buy a bad deal. And, and again, I said it earlier, I really don't ever want to disagree with the lumberjack landlord. I'll point out if he's wrong, he'll point out if I'm wrong and we have fun with that. Um, I don't want to say that I disagree with Michael Zuber, right? Because both of them are more uh, successful than him. Their portfolios are bigger. Their cash flow is multiples of what mine is, right? So when Michael Zuber says, I want my students to do good, uh, great deals, don't want them to do average deals. I'm okay with average. My, my first five deals were probably really average. It was, it was the sixth deal where I was like, wow, that's the best. What, what happened? That's a great deal, right? But five years later, those five average deals are amazing deals. Each one now has better than a 20% cash on cash return, very little turnover because they use my systems. Um, they're right. Go for the great deals. 
But even if, if, if you're just starting, don't be afraid to hit a base hit on that first one. It doesn't have to be a home run. Um, look at that, Matt. I made a baseball reference. Okay. Um, hip Harp won silver. Would you explain buy box? So that's a Michael Zuber. Um, make sure he gets credit that he has a buy box. For me, I have a video on my channel on how to run it like a business. So imagine a funnel where you have the whole planet and I'm not going to buy on other continents. So it narrows it down to my continent and I'm not going to buy on the other, on the, I'm on the West coast. I'm not going to buy on the East coast. So it narrows down to my state, my County. So I narrowed down this funnel into the area that I'm going to invest. That's called a footprint. The footprint is where you're going to invest. So if you live in a really high cost of living area and you don't want to do rent by the room by the like pod Baldwin, you're going to invest at a distance. That's your footprint. Where are you going to invest? The smaller you can make that, the better. Usually you get down to a zip code or two or a county. I invest in two counties, Pierce County and Thurston County in Washington State. That's my footprint. So I funneled that down to that's the area that I will buy in. Then I'm not looking for commercial properties, so I don't want storefront. So I, I funneled down, then I'm going to filter out. So funnel, then filter. I don't want properties that need a bunch of work. I don't want commercial properties. I don't want storage. I don't want, in my area, single family. I look for them. I look at them because if I ever found one that would cash flow, I would make the offer if the yield was there, but it's just not. So I'm filtering out the deals that I don't want. I don't want to do a burr or a rehab or a bunch of work. So I'm looking for rent ready or already occupied properties in my area. So my buy box is the box that's left. So funneled down to the area, filtered out to the type of properties that I want, which can be when you talk to a lender, that third step in getting started in real estate, learn to save, credit score, talk to a lender. The lender will tell you how much you can borrow. That's a filter. My auto searches go to a little bit above what I can afford to buy. I can't, if I can't borrow that much, I don't want to be looking at $3 million properties because it's a waste of time. So that's your buy box. You have funneled down to the area and you have filtered out to the type and price range of the properties that you're going to look at. So in that box, those are the ones you'll look at and the ones that stand out, you take a deeper look at. Okay, hopefully that made sense. After that, you convert. So if you funnel down and filtered out what's left are the ones you make offers on and you convert those into properties that you own and then you put your systems in place. So that's how you run it like a business. Funnel, filter, convert, systems. Um, let me see, here we go. Um, the chat moved, which I appreciate the chat. I just lose my spot. Okay. Just uh totally lost my okay buy box thank you carrie how many investment properties do you have now have you considered anything out of state i currently own so here's a breakdown of the portfolio 16 rental units seven properties one of them's paid off six have mortgages they're all in washington state i run a cdl school that that had four campuses we were looking to add a fifth in arizona so while we were looking for properties for the campus in Arizona. I was also looking for small multifamilies. This was about 2019, 2000, beginning of 2020. And I found several that I was going to buy, but we couldn't find a place for the campus. So I didn't buy there. Now we have put a campus in Twin Falls, Idaho. So I am looking in Washington for my next property and Twin Falls, Idaho, because I'm going to house hack both states. So this will be my first time getting out of state. It's not truly investing at a distance because I'm going to be in both locations. Um, so that's the breakdown of what my portfolio looks like now, uh, Rankin Projects. Howdy. Just checking in to say hello. Hello. Tom K. Walker, MD here also. Pulled the trigger last July and haven't looked back. Cash flow is great. Congratulations. That is awesome. REI Trainer. Dion, you are right. I remember when credit bureaus started showing trending payment activity, we would sometimes consider it for manually underwriting on mortgages at our credit union. Thank you. Tony Carr, thanks for your response and insight. Thank you for the question. So, Matt, Lumberjack Landlord, hanging in stealth mode, doing tax prep. Oh, that sounds fun. In between going to the garage to scream and not wake the kids. 
I like tax prep. Um, one Excel spreadsheet, tab for expenses, tab for incomes, send it to the CPA. But with you, Matt, you're doing the, your spouse is a real estate professional. You're going to make so much money on your taxes. It'll be worth it in the end. Yes. Don't pull out your, your hair. You'll end up like me. Uh, Janet, you are very good. Thank you. And howdy, Lumberjack. Kay Walker, Tom, way to go. The area I'm interested in is Cumberland primarily, but the research is getting me down. I'm looking every day and trying to learn, but for some reason, Cumberland is appealing. So as you look at an area for a long period of time, start shifting asset classes. Look at single family, small multifamily, house with an ADU, um, Maybe even look into commercial, depending on your comfort level with that lending structure. Uh, but look at somebody is investing there successfully. It might be that's where the Burr method works. It might be that's where getting in co contact with wholesalers gets you better deals than the MLS. In my area, that's the opposite. Um, so start looking at what is working in that area. It's, it's something from a law enforcement background. You don't look at a crime scene make a decision, you know, think, I, I think this is what happened and then look for evidence to back it up. That's what a lot of new investors do. They pick a strategy. I want to buy a multifamily uh, duplex or triplex because that's what Dion did and I'm going to do it in this market. And they look at that market and they spend months and months and months not realizing that single family perform better there. Look at the market, figure out who's investing successfully. Look, join the local groups, the REI Facebook groups, REI meetup groups, and think what strategy is working and then think, okay, how do I adjust my strategy to work in this market? Just like a cop looks at a crime scene, looks at all of the evidence and lets the evidence tell them what happened. And then we find more evidence, their opinion can shift. Um, Darkest Dreams 21, howdy. I hate you. If that makes sense, you feel better. <laughs> Mostly out of jealousy. Can you talk a little about how you approach lenders? How many do you hit up per deal? When I first started, um, and this comes out in my video that comes out on Thursday, the, the, the I interviewed Pasha and he talked to over 90 lenders. Um, I talked to five, but then I clarified. When I first started, I talked to over 30 over the period of a couple of years to narrow down to the ones that were responsive, that understood what I wanted to do, that gave me the feedback I was looking for. And I now have basically five that I talk to every single time. I have one that I'm pre-qualified with, uh, used to be Wells Fargo, now it's Fairway Mortgage. When I get under contract, I take what they're currently offering and I show it to the other four lenders so that all, all five of them have seen what I'm doing. Then the one that comes back with the best deal, best rate, it's either Fairway or I take the best one to Fairway and give them a chance to keep my business. I am an investor and I am transparent. We only have one reputation. So I never hide anything and I never say something that's not true to a lender. I say, I'm going to take what you're offering. I'm going to show it to other lenders. I'm going to take what they offer in response and let you see it and give you a chance to keep my business. If you're okay with that, we're going to work together. If you don't like that, you won't be one of my five and no, no harm, no foul. So that's how my lending works. Hope that helps. Um, dark streams. Also, do lenders have to be local to the property? No. Uh, my current lender that I'm looking at now, uh, that's a new addition to the five that I'm going to talk with. I would met through Matt the Lumberjack. Or, no, the other Matt. <laughs> El otro Matro. Uh, Matt the... Why can't I not remember his name? I hate my memory. Matt the Mortgage Guy. And he connected me with a lender in Portland, Oregon, close to Washington. Lenders need to work in the area, make sure that they're licensed to work in the area that you're doing, but they don't need to be local. Lumberjack Landlord, nailed the baseball reference. And it's likely any first deal is going to not be much more than a base hit. And that's okay, exactly. Chester, howdy. Good evening. Honing in on the buy box helps keep discipline. Yes, it does. The, the narrow it is, the easier it, the easier it gets to run the numbers. If you're trying to remember what the area average rents are in, in a half a state, 
<laughs> it's hard for me to remember the area average in just two counties. And I've been doing this for 10 years. There are certain areas where two blocks away, the rent is 50% more. It's just a better area. Um, yeah. And so the, the more refined you get that, the easier it is to do. Look at on Lumberjack Landlord. Oh, you are talking to us. Hello, Matt. Yep, I encourage Matt to chime in. Kay Walker, leave it to you, Dion, to put in my perspective. Thanks so much. You are right. Going to continue to do some educated research and then get out of my own way. Thanks a million. Yes, we are sometimes in our own way. Chester, I came in to the buy box conversation. Cool. Good. Warhorse 48. Howdy. I went to do a professional bull riders event this last weekend in Chicago. One of the bulls was named Not Today. I thought it was kind of cool. That is kind of awesome. Uh, it, how many years has it been since I did? I just rodeo and then bronc. That's been a billion years. Yeah, I think that's about the time. Um, Tom. Okay, Debbie, I'm in Cecil, right? In the 95 corridor with growth. I pass through Hagerston. Often on 81 tomorrow, actually, but my next house will be six plus beds to rent them all out. Awesome. Nice. The Todd Baldwin method. Phil Neeland. Great buy box summary. Thank you. Awesome. Dro, howdy. How many did you buy last year? I only bought one last year. Um, I do not have the same goals as the Lumberjack Landlord or Michael Zuber. I wanted to make work optional. That happened in 2018. My goal is increased cash flow. I would almost like reduced unit count. Um, I self-managed 16. I could probably self-manage up to 50, probably with no problems without even instituting more systems. Um, I would like to buy one, maybe two in 2022. Um, I looked. I put my buying on hold for a while to help a friend, and then I was working on stacking cash. I looked at doing a cash out refinance to possibly do that as well, um, based on some good advice from Matt and Mike. Um, yeah, so just one, I bought one duplex in May, uh, which I'm really happy with how it went. And, and, and that was my 15th and 16th units, so I call it Sweet 16. Um, Chester Williams, what kind of premiums are you seeing on IRs of investment properties over single uh, interest. What kind of premiums are you seeing on is that internal rates of investment property? I'm not sure what IRs are over single family dwellings. The interest rates are not much quarter point for a small multifamily above single family. Like I think, I think single family, I was getting like 2.8 something. And I got 3.1 on my duplex in May last year. So currently rates are going up, but there's always about that little bit of a gap. Not much, quarter of a point or so. Jonzo, the Asian Mai channel is good as well. I will have to check that out. Carrie, thoughts on condos, townhomes for longer holds? I avoid HOAs at all costs. Um, personal experience. So this is, this is just my opinion. Um, don't sue me, bro. The monthly fees for the HOA are not the problem. I like properties that appreciate and, and small multifamily in HOAs don't appreciate very well because investors don't want HOAs. Houses in an HOA, a single family house might appreciate better because you're dealing with homeowners that like a cleaner neighborhood. Investors don't like the rules, restrictions, and possible CCNRs that can become a problem with rentals with HOAs. You might buy a townhome or a condo, and the year you buy it, they, they are allowed 15 or 20% of their units to be rentals. You rent it out for seven years, your tenant moves out, and now they're at 40% because they screwed up on how many they can have, and you're not allowed to put a tenant back in there. So now you have to sell something that can't be a rental. The HOA fees aren't the problem. My problem is random assessments. The HOA decides to replace the gate with one that looks different. Totally works fine. Doesn't need any problems. Going to cost them 40 grand. You're hit with a $2,000 bill. Have no say so in the matter whatsoever. Don't even think it needed done. And it can happen. So random assessments to me are, are a danger. And then this is based on my personal experience. So if you're in an HOA, I'm not talking to you. HOAs that I've personally dealt with 
are full of people who have nothing but time to mess with their neighbors. The boards are made up of good old people clubs where I get written up and fined if I put a dumpster out there to do a project, but two houses down, the person who used to be on the board has a dumpster all year long and doesn't get to have a problem. So the HOAs cause more problems than they're worth. So I would not buy in a condo or a townhome if it was in an HOA, uh, personal experience. So that's my opinion on that. That doesn't mean it doesn't work. There are people who are successful about that. There was somebody that I heard recently who she joins the boards of the HOAs to have control over the HOA on where her rentals are. And that's something that works for her, not something that works for a lazy investor. Jonzo, Tom, how do I contact you? You guys should, I don't know if you could send messages in here, but you can put in your email and then take it out so it's not here forever. Uh, Darkest Dream 21, thank you very much. My hate has declined slightly. <laughs> Good. That's okay. I hate me plenty enough for all of us. Don, what do you think about cash for keys to vacate a unit? I've done it a couple times. Um, would you use it or are you in the camp of, I would never reward that behavior? No, there's all kinds of reasons. It doesn't have to be a negative behavior either. I, I purchased a fourplex and there was a tenant there that was on a month to month lease. And I know it sucks to have somebody buy your property and you have to move. So when I went and talked to the person, I was like, Hey, I'll, I'll pay a thousand dollars towards the deposit and wherever you have to move just to make this easier for you. I kind of mentally included that in my cost to acquire purchase and still got the return that I wanted. Um, I did it again one time. What, what was that? It's a hoarder on a purchase. So it's a one time I was like, yeah, I'm not even going to use the binder method on this person. It's not worth it. I want this person to go. And I, I, I do the one thing I suggest if you do the cash for keys method is don't give the person money, especially while they still live there because they could keep it and force you to go through an eviction. People suck. Pay the cash for keys toward the deposit on where they move with an agreement on that place that if they don't end up moving in, you get the money back. Um, so yes, I've, I've done that. It's it, it A lot of tenants live in fear of a property being sold and then they get kicked out because they don't usually have the money often to, to handle the move, the deposit, the first, the last, or whatever the fees are going to be. So anything you can do to help alleviate that um, helps me sleep well at night. Tom Kite, Jones, oh, I will send my email. There you go. Yeah, totally. Yeah, if you guys email me, I'll connect you. That way you don't have to share your email with the whole world. REI Stoners, what do you do if you put out multiple offers and get two offers accepted? That's happened a couple of times. You have an inspection period and you have an appraisal clause. And me, I tried to figure out how to make them all happen. Um, make sure your agent knows you're putting in multiple offers and, you, and they know that if, because it's, I make 20 offers to get one accepted. If I made three offers and three got accepted or two got accepted, I wouldn't be doing that. I, I would put in the ones that made the most sense. But since it's less than one out of 20 offers that gets accepted, it's kind of rare so that when they do both get accepted, then I can sit back and go, which one has the best yield? It's the best type. It's the hits all of my criteria. And then you can back out during your inspection period without having to pay for an inspection or appraisal. And your agent is going to understand that you had them do extra work. But as long as they knew that going in and, and they had the choice to tell you, Yes, or that they're not comfortable with it. I've, I've done that a couple of times. Don't have a problem with it. I think only really one time that all of a sudden, uh, I, one was accepted and I was like super excited. And then the other one got accepted and I thought, okay, now I need to pick. And a third one got a, a, a back of, uh, would you like to be in second position? And that was the one time I was like, yeah, no, because I've already got two I need to figure out. Um, so it, as long as your agent's okay with it, go for it. Uh, Angel R, does your buy box consist primarily of three bedroom, one bath, side by side? Uh, two bedroom with a garage or more side by side. Single family, uh, even though, like I said, they've never, never seen one that would cash flow. But I don't do rent by the room. I could probably make it work here, rent by the room, the way like Todd, Todd Baldwin does, uh, but the lazy. So I haven't done that yet. Um, two bedroom with garage or more, so three or more bedroom. I don't have a bathroom requirement, one but or more. And washer dryer hookups in unit, no short sales, no foreclosures, no HOAs. Uh, I think I have a video on my channel that says buying a rental, my search criteria that I broke down 
what's and that's my search criteria. It doesn't have to be yours. In your area, different things might work. Single single bedroom places might work great next to a college or in a retirement center area. I, I don't I don't invest in those. So I want two or more bedrooms. Um, figure out what works best in your market. Single family might perform best. My friend that invests in Ohio, the, the, they they're she's getting a better return on that than I do on my small multifamily. Um, so sometimes that's the way to go. Uh, Chester, Tom, never national, near National Harbor, clear on the other side of MD here. Nice. Uh, Jones O, once you're not a serial killer, all is well. But if it's my time, oh well. <laughs> exactly. Chester, in the expensive DC suburbs where Joe Asamoa is successfully renting to Section 8. Uh, so somebody is investing successfully interest rates yeah thanks that's what i thought yeah so a little bump for small multifamily angel r i have a gorgeous unit that just hit the market with skylights three two slightly more expensive than area average to compensate for the uniqueness of the house and not getting as many inquiries uniqueness matters to you and to short-term rentals uniqueness isn't a rental thing did you know that tenants like almost every single tenant of mine i've ever talked to has no clue what a square foot is They've never used it as a metric. They don't know what a den is. They don't know what a family room is. They don't know what a bonus room is. They go, how many bedrooms? How many bathrooms? Okay, that's what I want to rent. What's that got the best price? That's as simple as it gets. If you're looking for uniqueness, now you need a marketing team to make sure your advertisement is done right. Um, and uniqueness can matter more for short-term rentals than long-term rentals. Um, Angel, I learned a valuable lesson to focus on B-type properties instead. Sometimes less is more. Yep. Chester, laziness inspired me to find ways to be lazy. Acronyms fit the bill. <laughs> exactly. Tom Kine. As long, uh, Chester, as long as the yield works and scales, awesome. Todd Baldwin has an interview with a guy from there in his playlist. Nice. Bubble Rex, do you run your credit every time you want to buy a unit or do you want to be pre-approved by a lender? That would hurt your credit score. Kinda and no. So when you first start working with a lender, or if you haven't made an offer for a few months to get that letter of prequal, it's possible that they might run your credit. When they run your credit, you get a window of 30 days. And I've heard some people say 60 days, but I've heard 30 consistently. Where in those 30 days, your credit can be run as many times as you want by the same type of lender, and you only get one negative impact to your credit score. So, and once they run it, I've, I've had for six months, that lender give them letters of pre-qualification again, and then not run the credit until we go under contract. Once we're under contract, I don't care if they run the credit because that's the lender running the credit at that point. And then again, 30-day window for all of the other lenders to run the credit if they need to. When I do the lending thing, to, to help clarify, because that might be where the question came from, I have the one that has a prequal and I submit to get under contract. Once I'm under contract, those other lenders, I've never had one run my credit. They take the first letter from the lender. And they tell me what they would do. This is what our rate would be. This is what our fees would be. And then I go back and I give that first lender a chance to keep it. Once I go and I say, okay, so you are the lender I'm going to use, whether it's the original one or a new one, then they'll run the credit. To the underwriters will go, okay, we're currently under contract to buy. He's using us. Run the credit. So you'll get that one time then. But I've never had like five of them run my credit because they see it in writing from another lender that, that that they've approved me for it. So they'll just say, yep, we would do it. They do probably have some little caveat in there that says, unless we run your credit and it's 50 points lower than what you said or whatever, then, then they, they, I'm sure they protect themselves, but I haven't had that problem. Um, REI Stoners, off to check out the Tacoma Nightlife. Have a good night, Dion. Great to meet you. Ciao, check out Dorkies. Dorkies in Tacoma is fun. It is a uh, stoner friendly because you're REI stoners. Um, arcade bar. So there you go. Bubble Rex, can you mention your top five lenders? Everybody hates them. Wells Fargo. No good luck with uh, Bank of America. Uh, so just to be super petty, I keep my money in Bank of America, but all my loans through other lenders. And then Fairway Mortgage, Guild Mortgage, and get a connection through Matt, the mortgage guy. 
Those are the, those are the four. And then I'll usually check a local credit union, but I've never had luck with them. For the, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a Washington thing. They just suck. They're literally a point and a half above the best offers from anyone else. So also the problem might be, I don't have a relationship with the local credit union to so that, you know, to be fair, to be fair. Um, Castania, when you buy properties, do you buy under your name or an LLC? I specifically buy the properties in my own name. There are times it makes sense to have an LLC. Um, if you have partners, an LLC will protect you from someone else's mistakes. If you want to use commercial lending or hard money, an LLC might be required by the lenders. Once you have 10 mortgages in your own name, you're probably going to have to go with commercial lending and that might require an LLC. But as an investor, there is absolutely no benefit to having an LLC for a rental property. There is no tax benefits. There is no asset protection. Um, I'm actually going to be making a video on my opinions of LLCs, and it's going to be a rant because so many people keep telling new investors that you need an LLC when often it's not the case. And it stops some investors from getting started. And to me, that's a really bad thing. Um, but I'm waiting until I have 10,000 subscribers because it's going to piss off a lot of people when I have a rant on something they probably believe in. Um, and I know I'm going to lose a bunch of subscribers. So I'm waiting until I have 10,000 so that there's some people left when that happens. Um, and that question does come up often. I think it came up twice in this live stream because that's how common it is. So that's a good question and it's something to consider. So there are times it makes sense for you to have an LLC. If, if you are in those times, great. If it's not, Often there's no reason to. Mark Alexander, howdy. You're looking great with the beard. Thank you. Uh, if you speak sign language, in one of my previous videos, I actually explained why I got the beard. Um, <laughs> Taylor Vitale, howdy. This is awesome. I've seen you on Bigger Pockets podcast this week and I've been binging your old live streams. I'm just getting started. Where should I start and what first steps? Thank you, Dion. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, come back every Tuesday with actual questions. I answer them live and I guarantee if you have a question, somebody else is probably thinking the same thing. There's a video on my channel called Before Buying a Rental, What Do? Or The Six Steps to Get Started in Real Estate. Those two videos kind of break out the steps to getting started. And then once you have those steps down or know what step you're on, then you'll actually kind of maybe know which questions to ask me. Um, I don't have a course. I do have a playlist called Tired of Selling Your Life One Hour at a Time. That's the playlist I would go through of, of my, I do, I try to do 10 minute videos or so to cover a concept. And then each one of those concepts, you know, it helps you become a better investor. And my goal is to share this information and answer as many questions as I can. And, uh, help you make work optional. That's my goal. Um, so I'm glad you came to the channel. Appreciate it. Taylor, I've had down payment credit and I'm currently getting approved for your first mortgage. Nice. Okay. So you'll have to approve it on what you can do. So then um, choose a strategy. Are, you know, are you, are you going to buy and hold? Is it going to be short term, long term, uh, single family house with an ADU? Small multifamily, it's going to be commercial. What, what type of strategy are you going to use? Are you going to house hack? Narrow all that down and then have an agent set up auto searches for you or a couple of agents. I always use at least three with auto searches set up. And then keep me in mind. I'm going to put my um, email in the chat again so that people can see it. Uh, I answer questions anytime. Just feel free to email me. Although I do like it if people come here on Tuesdays and ask questions because other people want to see it too. Um, Chester, Tom Kine, yep. Joe Asamoah does really well in DC proper. Yep, to Dion's point, I wish I had more debt to buy in the city proper, especially in the up and coming neighborhoods. Yep, I, it confuses people when I say that, but that's another video that's on my channel that I like. I wish I had more debt, which is why this video, when I started this, the first 10 to 20 minutes or so, I didn't really pay attention, is on how debt can make work optional the different types of debt and when to pay debt off and when to create more good debt versus bad debt. <laughs> um, Kay Walker. Hey Dion, one more question. How do you control tenant communication? Do you have separate cell phones for each for personal and your properties? No, 
I have one phone that all the tenants have access to and most of the people I've interacted with from YouTube land um, have access to. I'll text anytime. I have never in 10 years answered the phone to talk to somebody. I don't have voicemail set up. If, if you want to communicate with me, there's email and there's text. Um, I have had phone calls, but I don't just answer the phone. Um, I set expectations with tenants early. I, I make sure that they understand the fire, flood, or blood rule. If there is a fire, flood, or blood, you text, you can call, you can email, get a hold of me as quick as possible. That's when you can contact me. Anything else can be a text or an email. And if any conversation seems to be important, I make sure that it goes to email because in Washington state, so check your local laws, emails are admissible in court, texts are not. So I wouldn't want to communicate something via text that I would then have to use in court because it wouldn't count. Um, set expectations early and let them know, like, you know, these are the fire, flood, or blood doesn't have a time. 24 hours a day, weekend, you can call me for whatever and we can get it handled. But if the cabinet isn't closing right that's an email and my handyman will handle it when i get to him once i've had a handyman at a property a couple of times my handyman kind of know the threshold of up to a couple hundred dollars they can make repairs and then just bill me later um, but if it's something big like do they replace the stove or do i have one in storage then contact me sometimes i'll pair a tenant up with a handyman and say call the handyman you don't even need to contact me for any of your issues except fire flood or blood um so set expectations early and everything just goes to text. Uh, so if you've ever texted me or emailed me and I don't get a hold of you, email me again. And uh, I, I don't think I've ever missed a text, but yeah. Um, then I lost where I was at. Okay, Larry, Arcade Bar, that sounds <laughs> as good as real estate. It's a pretty fun place. It's in Tacoma called Dorkies. What's the status on the million dollar deal? I'm currently hunting. I have I, two, yeah, only two. So I need to find another couple agents that want to set up auto searches for me in Pierce and Thurston County for small multifamily, up to $1.3 million, preferred fourplex, side-by-side -side units, garage for each unit, washer dryer hookups in each unit, no HOA. So there's a couple of other things too. Well, um, currently hunting. Uh, and I will find it. I think I saw somewhere earlier, and I must have missed it, where somebody asked me if I ever built new. If you, if anybody's typed a question and I missed it, please put it in again. I try to catch them all, but sometimes the chat moves. Um, okay. Hip Hop One Silver. I may have confused you guys in the Amigos when my accountant told me to take trash out, he meant to sell our worst ratio cash flow unit C and buy more B units, which we did. If it made sense to your portfolio, would you? And the cash flow might have been lower. Was the turnover low higher? Uh, was the yield higher or lower? Um, so, what makes most sense to you? Do it as long as it's not stopping you in your tracks. That's when. Uh, yeah, that's when I would have a problem. Jimena, hola, cómo está mi do you have a personal emergency fund? If so, how many months in expenses? Um, that is too much thinking. So uh, to diga la verdad, um, simple, keep it simple. It has to be like kindergarten simple for me. My personal emergency fund is the same as my rental emergency fund. When I had seven units or less, I kept $10,000 there. As my units got bigger and more things could go wrong and like it can, you know, consecutively go wrong, I've raised it to 30,000. So there's $30,000 in the account that I consider as an emergency fund. Personal, business, don't know how many months that would be. Uh, too much thinking. Got to keep it simple. I have a W-2 job where I'm still making decent money. If I ever stop working, I'm going to probably double that reserve. As my portfolio grows, when I add my next property, the next fourplex that I'm hoping is at least a million dollars, I'm probably going to raise it to 50,000 or maybe 60. I might double it. Um, so that's how I handle my reserves. Thank you. That was a good question. I actually think that's the first question you've asked. David, howdy. Dion, I appreciate your time and content. Currently purchasing a house in Vegas, hoping to close early next month. Awesome. Congratulations. Nice. That is still a hot market. Um, yeah. 
Um, do you wait for, oh, so Christina, Christina, uh, do you wait for your property to have specific amount of equity first before purchasing the next one? I probably would if my equity was ever above uh, 30%. So if I had 70, more than 70% leveraged, I would probably wait until I built up equity or I would put a bigger down payment on the next property to make sure that the equity stayed at least 30%. Um, yes. So I want to maintain always 30% or more equity. Um, so as, as it, but I look at the whole portfolio. So right now I'm, I'm below 60% leverage, which means my next purchase, if I, if I, if after the fourplex, I buy another one and I use my VA loan and I do a 0% down loan and it's a hundred percent financed. I think overall I would still be able to maintain 70% or less leveraged because I look at the whole picture to make that decision. David L. I'm a class B driver in Tacoma and thinking about getting my class A. Will I need to take all tests all over again in order for me to do class A? Yes. And in 2019 or 2020, so it's been over a year, they changed the regulations to upgrade from a B to an A. You used to be able to just pass the tests. Since that change, you have to actually do the recorded 50 hours behind the wheel, just like you've never had a license. So uh, my email is in the chat. If you want to reach out directly, I can walk you through what those requirements are when they changed how, how you get it taken care of um yeah and then if you get the a help you find a job uh north cal two questions first if rental out of your area your opinion on property management yes if if, if i was at a distance i would have a property manager i i, I it's possible to self-manage at a distance but i would prefer to have a property manager i want boots on the ground in the area Second, how would you dispute questionable repairs with property managers? Screening them, get multiple quotes. Finding a good property manager is one of the reasons, the contributing factor as to why I don't have a property manager. Um, I think it would be easier now having experience, knowing how long the timeline for a rehab should be, how much the cost estimate should usually be. I would be able to recognize um, fees like... Somebody in a Facebook group recently complained they have a property manager that charged them $35 to go change out a light. So I said, you're complaining? And he says, yeah, that's expensive. The light was like $7. And I said, okay, yeah, but it was a light. It was third floor and it was a 16 foot ladder to get there to do the light. So for them to have the insurance, to have the handyman, to take the time to go out there, pay an hourly wage, $35 is a discount to change a light. So Having that knowledge would be a lot easier than if you bought a property in another state and you had no bound, no no basis to understand what prices should be. It's probably a little more likely that you're going to feel ripped off when you see prices that are probably accurate. Um, yeah, so if you can buy properties and property manage yourself to get that experience, then it's probably a little easier. Because like Michael Zuber says, you're either managing your tenants or you are managing your property manager. Taylor, thank you for answering my questions. I will do both. Good. Email you and ask questions here. I plan on, on a small multi and house hack at FHA for your loans too. That is your ideal scenario. It's great. And so that the, FHA, the great thing with FHA, so I did a 5% down conventional on a duplex back in the dinosaur days. Like you, know, you, were, you could do that. Most lenders recently have wanted 15 or 20% down for a small multi-family, even if it's house hacked. That's a lot of money. FHA will go all the way up to a fourplex at 3.5% down. So for a small multifamily, it's probably your best best choice. Larry, I suggest you include the trust component to your LLC rant video. The more alternative solutions you provide to the folks, then the less likely they'll be they'll unsubscribe. That is a brilliant idea. And yeah, so it'll it'll have, I'm definitely gonna have the trust. That's great. I will add that. But it's going to have, to be clear, like here are the times it makes sense. This is when you should do it. Like, So it's not just don't ever do it. Um, it's don't let it be a barrier to somebody becoming a new investor when it doesn't have the impact people are hoping for. But that's a great idea. Thank you. North Cal. Might have been answered already. Do you ever use creative financing, seller financing for rental purchases? Thank you um, yeah, for all the great info. Thank you. So far, it's all traditional lending, properties found on the MLS, 
but I have, since my last offer, decided to make a seller financing offer and a traditional lending offer on every offer going forward. Um, haven't done it yet. So, so far, everything's been just a conventional loan. Um, make sure I got everything in the question. I haven't done creative financing. I want to do seller financing going forward. It doesn't have the impact to the 10 Fannie Freddie loans that you can have in your name. Um, there's a couple other benefits to it. Um, yeah, so I haven't done it yet, but I will. Justin Hollenquist, howdy. What sites do you prefer to collect rent? Advertise your rentals or do background checks? So I use apartments.com to do credit check, background check, or um, evictions check. And uh, collecting rents, I do it. I have a video on my channel. Uh, three things to consider when collecting rents. First, I want to make it easy on the tenant. So I have several ways to collect rent. Zelle, Venmo, Cash App, ACH, take a check, um, PayPal, okay, any way that, and the second thing, it leaves an electronic paper trail. So there's a receipt without me having to generate a receipt. Somebody pays me with PayPal, there's a note. They pay me with ACH, it, it's, there's a transaction on my bank account. And third, I want to save a trip to the bank. So I don't want to do anything where I have to go to the bank. I don't like to get cash. I do have one tenant who pays in cash and I'm not sure what they do for work, but it's always small bills. Um, so it's interesting, but it makes it easy on the tenant. So when I can, I don't want to have to go to the bank. I have a couple tenants who still pay with check. It was one for a long time, but now there's two and I just deposit those with an app. So th that's how I collect rent. And for the background and that kind of stuff, it's apartments.com. Free for the owner, $45 fee for the applicants. Uh, Chester, Larry, agreed. Providing attentive alternatives allows people to expand their thinking or name the video, the pros and cons of business structures. Kinda. Um, no, no, you're, you're right. Giving them alternatives is right. Um, the title though, because I'm waiting till 10,000, I really want it to be something that <laughs> explains how angry I get when I know people are repeating something that is costing new investors from taking from taking action. So it's going to be something like, uh, I, can't, I can't even say it because it's unprofessional. <laughs> uh, Jones O, would you do a construction loan to permanently build a duplex, triplex, quad, Look into it because again, your area, MD areas having existing multifamily it doesn't have. So I would look for houses with ADUs if you don't find small multifamily because a lot of times that's easier to find. How are you searching where you don't think that there's a lot of small multifamily? I've talked with a lot of investors who go, I look on Zillow, I look on Redfin, I look on all of these sites and I never see any small multifamily and that you're never going to. My small multifamily in my area have never showed up on Redfin or Zillow until three months after I closed. And then they just show up as pending. Small multifamily goes on the MLS and off the MLS in about an hour. So if you don't have auto searches set up with agents and you're checking it constantly, you're never gonna see them. Um, but house within ADU is another option. And I have not done a build, uh, don't have the patience and I don't wanna manage a project. I have a friend who's doing a build. He bought three acres in a town It had a house. He put a pad for his RV. He's building a duplex and an ADU and then a tiny home. So he's doing those builds. And then the pandemic hit. So everything's been put on hold because cost of materials tripled or more. Um, but he's about ready to start his build now. Uh, there are, And I, I think one of these Thursdays, the three amigos, I'm going to ask them. I think I'm going to do that this week. Ask Matt and Mike to do a video for my channel on when does it make sense to build versus buy. So they can break down the logic process of cost of properties, availability of properties, cost of materials, how long it would take to get a yield. And, and from, from their educated and experienced points of view, when does it make sense to do which one? So we'll look forward to that video coming out on Sunday. Because when we do a video on Thursday, that's when I release the Three Amigos videos. Sunday. Um, looked. Okay, Jones. I still don't get why they don't just build cheaper housing more duplexes and try except to just limit who can invest in the area because the builder wants to make the most profit. And there's an echelon, a four person echelon on who pays what. The person who will pay the most, the person the builder's going to pursue buys on payment. 
So the home buyer buys, buys the most house they can afford based on payment. They're not looking at yield. They're not looking at return. They're not looking at selling. They're looking at how much can they afford. The next person is the investor who's looking at yield. How much can I make? So that's your small multifamily. Then you have flippers who look for how much they can value add. And then you have wholesalers who are looking for the gap between ability to buy and ability to sell. So all the way up here is what builders are looking for. So it's actually rare for small multifamily to be built unless you hire the contractor to build it as a, as a plan. But somebody who says, oh, I'm gonna put in a subdivision and do 20 buildings and it's gonna take me four years, they're gonna build houses. So David L, thank you, Tom. So I keep posting email, but I don't think YouTube's letting you know. I have it blocked to where you can't post a link because you see all those every now and then there's a link to like a, a porn channel or something. They're doing it a hundred times. And that's the one where they didn't include the link. Um, and just so everybody's aware on how many questions we have, um, I think we're going to go for another 10 minutes or so. So if you have any more questions, let's go ahead and get them in. Uh, Where was I? Yeah, go ahead and email me and then I'll connect you guys. But I don't send to Dion on Facebook. You can send to me on Facebook or I put my email in the chat. Either one of those will work. Niles, just ch how do you Niles? Just chimed in after dinner and I've hit the like button. Four hour stream today. <laughs> I'm surprised my voice lasted so long. Um, and yeah, I haven't even drank anything. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, beast mode, Jones. Oh, cheers. Cheers. There we go. The cool thing about vodka in Mountain Dew is you can't smell it. You can taste it, though. I bet the LLC ramp boost subscriber count. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Here's to hoping. Tom. Yeah, he does. But when I get... The long vids, they are great to listen to while driving. Yes. So I, I do try to make every video 10 minutes. So here's a breakdown of the channel. I try to do 10 minute videos on something that teaches you like the last one was which locks to use. And you would think it would be just like, here's 10 seconds. This is the lock I use. Thanks very much. No, it's this is the lock. This is why because of how the batteries last. This is the configuration I do. This is where I buy them. This is what it does for the tenant. This is how it limits tenant turnover. This is how it helps the binder strategy. Like all it takes to explain why this is a lock to use. It takes 10 minutes. So most of my videos I shoot for 10 minutes. When I do a deal deep delve with somebody where I go into one of their deals, we usually talk for 30 minutes and I try to narrow that down to at least 20 or less. So I get that most of the people that are here for my content are looking for that short video. But the live streams, there are some people who want two or three hours of content. And that's what I look for. When I'm looking for something, I, I've got a long drive or I'm at work and I can put an earbud in. Uh, I want long content. So I'm hoping that the people who want the short content recognize, don't click on the live stream, you know, because um, somebody sent me a message complaining about the links of the live stream, that the benefit to my channel is they're all short videos. And then the live streams come out and they're three hours long. And I'm like, right. But there's two videos a week that are... 10 minutes or so. It's just one live stream a week to get this. So I'm glad somebody is enjoying it. Yeah. Um, Tom, I think the LLC rant should have three LLC warriors. So the rant turns into a roast. <laughs> That's a good idea. Um, I don't know if somebody who, who says you need to have an LLC would come on here though. I could look for it. Because I know Matt and Mike have LLCs because they are at the point where it makes sense. Those times where it makes sense to have an LLC. Hip Hop One Silver. Why I still have my real estate broker's license. I get 3% buyer or selling and my realtor friends are always calling me for rentals. Awesome. Yep. So there, there are times where having a, a, um, your real estate license or your broker's license or, your, or whatever makes sense. I have a video on my channel on the list of reasons why I don't have my agent's license. First, if I got my agent's license because I was looking for another job, I'd be a great agent. I would figure it out. I would educate myself and I would do it right. <clears throat> Even as an introvert, I'd pull off the people skills. But if I got my real estate license from my deals, would you want to work with a real estate agent who's only ever had one client? 
that is about as part-time as you can get. And I wouldn't want to work with a part, not much of a part-time agent. And second, there are a bunch of rules and regulations that apply to the real estate agents here in Washington state that I don't need to know. I send parts of the inspection report to the seller. I send love letters to the seller, which in some states, the agent's not allowed to submit a love letter. In Washington, I'm a consumer. I can do all kinds of things that agents aren't allowed to. Um, so if it makes sense for you and you're going to do enough deals, because I do one deal a year, maybe two, right? I, I'm not looking for 50 deals. I'm looking for one or two rentals a year to add to the portfolio. That's not enough work for me to be a good agent. Um, but if it's working for you, that's great. Just for me, I, I know it's not the best option. Um, Joshua McClellan messing with me. <laughs> Howdy, Josh. Thanks. Chester. Thanks again on the info on the Schlag locks. Good. I hope they work. Um, I'm, I've had really good luck with them. Jones, when you blow up, I'm going to miss this level of interaction. Now, I'm still going to do the live streams and I'm still going to be giving out my email. Um, I think if the YouTube channel ever blows up, I think that's where financial freedom will pay off because I do work a full-time job, but it's a really flexible full-time job. Um, Northwest Coast. Howdy. Playing at 1.5x and just caught up 10 minutes ago. To go. Nice. Thanks for the content as always. Awesome. That is that is a smart thing. I do appreciate when people hang out and they have questions and they help me with this interaction, but 1.5 speed helps because especially with my memory issues, sometimes it takes me two or three seconds to get my thoughts in order to make sure that I'm giving something that's clear and concise. Rob, thanks. Larry, the dark side of LLCs, cost versus protection when using umbrellas and trusts. That's a that's a good one. I like it. Tom, after three hours, still have over 50 viewers and like 84 likes. Yeah, I do appreciate the likes. Thank you. Um, and look, there's another porn video you can try to click on. If you can't click on it, just copy it, paste it to the search bar. Let me know what you find. Don't do that. Tom, 92. Nice. Scott. Great job, Dion. I've heard bits and pieces. I'm going to re-listen to this one in its entirety. Awesome. Great. No, I appreciate it. <clears throat> Jones. Good night. So I think I'll give it like one more minute in case you have any questions, but I really just want to say thanks for everybody who took the time to hang out tonight. I really hope the information helped. Um, next Tuesday, 4 p.m. I'll be back here. Um, yeah, I look forward to these. I think sometimes people ask a question and that sparks a whole conversation on a topic. I'm not even tracking that it's something I should cover. So Josh, hi Dion, little off topic. I'm military PCSing soon from Florida to Hawaii. And I recently bought a home in Florida using your VA loan. What kind of loan can I use to buy a home in Hawaii with no or low money down? This is not sarcasm. This is a real answer. Your VA loan. You can have more than one. You can use it more than multiple times. Um, they changed it, I think, in 2020 to where um, it, it's a completely new system. So talk to lenders and see if you can do that. You can also have an FHA loan while you have a VA loan. Generally, unless because PCSing means you have orders. So that one year of intend to occupy, you, you get a waiver for. Um, so you have several options. I don't know about Hawaii's first time home buyer program programs because different counties have different uh, options at different points. So FHA would be 3.5% down. Um, and if you can do small multifamily, uh, jumbo loan amounts just went up in November. So you have some options there. VA loans do not have an upper loan limit. Uh, so there's been some really cool changes with the VA loans re recently. So thanks for your service and enjoy um, Hawaii. That's the one place I did not get to go while I was in the military. Well, I get the lot I didn't get go to, but that's when I wanted to. Chester, working through the buy box while listening in. Thanks as always. Awesome. Phil, thank you. Thank you. North Cal, thanks again. Smash the like. Thank you. I appreciate that, everybody. Uh, Tom, great performance. Great info. Take care, family. Thank you. Ciao. Chester, wait. VA loans are allowable for investment properties all the way up to four units, as long as you're going to own or occupy. So you have to intend to occupy. So you can use VA loans to buy a house that you're going to rent out rooms in or a house that you're going to move out of in a year and turn into a rental. 
or you're going to buy a house with an ADU or a small multifamily up. And I say up to four units, but most of the lenders I talk to say VA loans will go up to five units. So check specifically with your lender as you're looking for properties. Yep. John Williams, fantastic as always. Thank you, John. Abby, howdy. Do you have a default list? Paint type, color, LVB type, and color, faucet company, electric appliances, etc. I don't. I do have a paint, a Sherman Williams paint of a certain style with certain colors for, for rentals. I don't have that with me. Um, I have a local flooring company, and whenever I'm doing LVP, I go in and find out what they've got at the current deal. Um, so my LVP and my different units might be different, but in the unit itself, it's always the same. Because uh, what the current deal, so Lowe's and Home Depot, LVP, I've never had any good luck finding good quality stuff there at the right price. But here in Tacoma, and they don't sponsor this, so Floor Trader of Tacoma has a great store here, and I get all my stuff from them. And I go in, and they've got pallets of what I need, and I look through until I find the, the style that I want with the thickness that I want. Um, great luck with them. Uh, but I don't really have a faucet list uh, or anything like that. That For those kind of things, I will go to Lowe's or Home Depot and... Uh, currently what makes the most sense for whatever project I'm doing. I don't do rehabs or the burn method, so I don't have a bunch of those going on. I'll have, I purchased a fourplex and out of all of them, I replaced one sink because it was an original version where it was flat and you couldn't put big pans in the sink to cook. So I was like, no, I'm gonna put a new, new high rise uh, faucet in there. So I just went and bought whatever from Lowe's or Home Depot that time, but I don't have a default. Thanks, Palavi. Joshua, thank you. Adam, thank you. Probably LLC could be problematic. Yes, but it'll be fun. So again, thanks everybody. Have a week full of awesome. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk. And we are sorry, the number you have tried is not in 